Hey. Hey, Witch. How, How was your weekend? Uh, rainy. Super. Oh, yeah, that's right. rain. You guys got a lot of rain. It, was, it was great. Really nice here. It was just very windy yesterday. I don't know mm. what was up with that. My parents just went down the shore. They went to Cape May, which is like the southernmost tip of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. They went into the storm. There was like, like it rained. Oh, no. Raining down there all weekend, and it was gorgeous here all weekend. They're like, why should we like even go? Like, what that sucks? Oh, they, they went anyway because I mean, they paid for the bed and breakfast, and like it's already paid for. So they yeah. they went. But my dad, he hates driving in the rain, so he was like, uh, yeah, that's stressful. Yeah. I don't like that either. No. Yeah, I will be the one to like pull over if mm -hmm. I can't see. I'm not driving. I, especially at night. I don't know if your eyes do this. With the lights and the rain and sometimes you can't see the lines on the road at night. Yeah. Do you wear night glasses at all? No. Yeah, I do. I have to wear I just try not to drive at night. Well, I mean, I, you can't avoid it all the time. So I have yeah. to wear glasses or yeah, my eyes do the same exact thing. Everything looks all like blown out. Like especially when it's lights are mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I hate, I hate driving in the highway, driving on the highway in the rain. The worst. Yes. At night the worst you know who wears glasses who our subject today oh yeah <laughs> i was trying to do a segue i like that segue he does wear yeah, glasses man. this is our patron pick you guys wanted to know all about the director of our favorite movie practical magic griffin dunn so we're going to talk all about griffin dunn today and we learned a little bit about him in another one of our episodes on i think our trivia episode right mm-hmm yeah, but today, lots of notes. There's like 30 some pages of notes. Yeah. Somebody just DM'd me on Instagram. I think it was on my personal account. And they sent me a bit like a, you know, one of those reels, a behind the scenes of Practical Magic. And it was like, did you know the director, Griffin Dunn, hired a real witch, a yeah. blah, 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 blah. And the movie was cursed. And then he had to hire somebody <laughs> to exercise the movie. And I was like, we already covered this in our episode, Goofs and Trivia. I like that he is pro witchcraft or pro manifestation. Mm -hmm. Like he believes in it. He's like, okay, I, I'm feeling this way. How do I combat that? Yeah. You know, and he seeks out external means of combating that. I think yeah. it's neat. He's I like it. how he got a handle on the Maloikyo before it Maloikyo. Maloikyo. He was like, no, no, I'm not going to be Maloikyoed by your creepy ass. Mm -hmm. And then he hired somebody to come in and, I guess, cleanse. Reverse it. Yeah, cleanse the movie and cleanse him. and Because it was like an attack on him personally, right? Yeah, I'm curious to know because it said, we don't know if it's factual, that some weird stuff started happening on set. And like, it's not like it could be haunted or anything because it, well, it could be, I guess, because the shell was created on on the Indian burial ground, right? Indian burial ground. That's but then, and then, like, a Hollywood backlot? I don't know. Seems yeah. a little weird. Yeah. Wait, what do you, wait, Hollywood backlot? The stuff that wasn't shot in the shell. Like, if weird stuff oh, was happening yeah. on set in a, a closed. Is that where the weird stuff was happening? I don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to balance out where, where it could have been happening. Can we talk about this later on in this episode? Maybe. Like, is there an article that we have later on that kind of like lays? I think it touches on it. I don't know if it, I, I don't know if we ever really find out where, what location right. this weird stuff was happening. That would, that's why it would be amazing to interview him. Just I to, know. Like, pick his he brain. doesn't answer his DMs. I know. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tag him. Was that me or you? That I I think. Oh wait, no, that must have been you. I don't have Discord open, so I don't. Mine's not open either. What? Weird. <gasps> Are we cursed? <gasps> oh my god. We need to call call in a D Maloikioer. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking about Griffin Dunn today. We don't have, I don't think, any business to handle beforehand. Uh, patrons, thanks for voting on this. We have, uh, where, where are we at when this comes out? It's almost, uh, this will come out like June 23rd. Holy shit. That's crazy. That, yeah. I mean, that's middle of the year. Yeah. I, wow, we really appreciate everybody who goes over there and like kind of helps us sift through the 200 plus topics we have we don't give them to y'all at once we give you a couple to pick from and that's really helping because yeah. it's not always something we would pick right that's great yeah it kind of forces us to talk about things that we probably because if it were up to me 
every single week would be magic and lore and just like I know or herbal yeah herbal stuff herbal stuff but like yeah and we know you guys want to hear about the cast and the crew and the writers and the, you know mm -hmm. people who are kind of involved but more so on the back end of things mm -hmm. stuff that you don't necessarily see on the screen mm -hmm. right so it is, I'm glad you guys are making us talk about all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk. So we're going to talk about Griffin Dunn today. And he's related to some other notable people in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk a little bit about his late sister, Dominique Dunn. She was on The Poltergeist. And then also, he, I didn't know this, he was related to the writer Joan Didion. What does she write? I don't know if I, I know her. He wrote a lot of stuff like in the 60s. I believe. Okay. I'm not, cool. I never read anything she's written, but she's a very prominent writer. She just recently passed away, I believe. Right? Didn't she recently pass away? Maybe in the last year, a couple years? Oh, yeah. Two, I think two years ago. We have a little more on, on her later. Yeah. I'm tried not to read too, as you know, I'm a great sight reader, but I really try not to like spoil it because mm -hmm. I like being surprised. Right. But we do have more on it later. Yeah. But should we introduce him a little bit? Um, his real name is Thomas Griffin. Is it? done oh and he was born on june 8th 1955 he's an actor he's a producer and a dire film director as you know he directed practical magic and he's known for quite a few other well-named titles which we'll get into later for this episode i wanted to go back to the practical magic commentary and like the extra feature stuff because that's where i was first introduced to him mm -hmm. and he's like seeing him now like Practical Magic coming into my life feels like yesterday. And like seeing him in the commentary or like in the extra features, that's how I picture him. And I love the picture that you did for the uh, Listen Now post. And I always like people age all the time, but he's like such a handsome man, you know, to begin with. And he's just aging nicely, I think. AI baby. I can't take credit for that. I just, <laughs> I just plugged his name into an AI, AI generator baby. and it was like, here, this is, this is beautiful. And I was like, yeah. yeah, I always liked him because we'll come across it later that his deliverance or his like cadence of speaking is kind of how I've always felt like my brain is either two steps ahead or two steps behind my mouth. <laughs> so I really get him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start off with the commentary? Yeah, let's start with the commentary. There were some things that we pulled about the actors he worked with on the set, and this is directly out of there. So we have Sandy, we have Nicole, who played Sally and Jillian. Aiden Quinn talks about him. So does Goron. We have some things about Griffin. So this is on the DVD, right? So if you have the Practical Magic DVD from like the 90, late 90s, early 2000s this dvd is double-sided right you put it in one side if you guys remember there's like a cauldron and like other like little elements around it right and you have to put the right kind of herbs you have to put the herbs in the right order into the cauldron in order to access some of these bonus features right that is right dude the day i found <laughs> out like the answer is hidden within the dvd case i was is it? i had tried for a while wait what like, do you I'm mean gonna... it's hidden within the dvd case so to get the right combination of uh, like herbs to put in, if yeah. you open the DVD case and you flip it upside down, shut up! It's right there. It tells, it tells you. you? Put... Yeah, but how did you get it without knowing the right combination? I probably Googled it. I don't oh remember. Oh my god! <laughs> I don't remember. I was. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so, so long that ago. That blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, but I remember like finding that out, and it was like a little game. It was like you know finding the clues and mm -hmm. yeah it was a lot of fun so this commentary was this a part of that little little game if, if you like put in the herbs and you access that little cauldron thing you get access I to know if, uh, i don't know if the commentary is part of the extra stuff or it's you automatically get it under like the audio settings okay yeah 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 but it was a lot of fun but this commentary can be found i don't remember what side of the disc this is on but it is a two-sided disc and there is a lot of extra content that yeah. is fun to watch it says special features Housing. interactive cauldron game unlocking two behind the scenes documentaries making magic and casting the spell and a feature length audio commentary by sandra bullock director griffin dunn and producer denise Tenovi and composer alan silvestri there you go there you go there you go yeah so this uh commentary we're about to review right now is from the dvd this is kind of interspliced i tried to organize it a little bit by who was saying what so sandra bullock was talking about griffin and she says and then when i started to look for the person to helm this speaking about the movie it had such a whimsical quality and they needed to be able to bridge fantasy and reality well, he, talking about Griffin, does that. And he's such an amazing guy. No one can make me laugh. He's got a great sense of humor and a great soul, too. He has so much history that he brought to it. And then she continues in the DVD extra saying, insane. 
mental instability. He's one of the funniest human beings ever to set foot on this planet. And she goes on, the fact that he was an actor for so many years and grew up in such a creative family, he has instincts and 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 intuitions that I've never been around in my life. <laughs> and yeah. then Nicole says about Griffin in the extras, I can't even remember how I would do her accent. I can't remember. She says though that it's fun working with a director that has a sense of ridiculousness and a sense of the macabre. She really liked the dark ac- aspects. Yeah, that he brought and, to the movie, and he meets that with comedy so well. Like he mm-hmm. kind of like crosses the two, and I guess that's why a lot of the critics maybe look down upon the movie because a lot of the critics were like, "This movie doesn't know what it wants to be. Does it want to be a horror? Does it want to be a comedy? Does it want to be a romance? Like, what is this movie?" Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that was what was charming about the movie. I really loved that about the movie. You get everything. That, that yeah. is all those things. Yeah, and then Aiden Quinn, who plays Officer Gary Hallett, says that it's rare that as an actor that you feel completely at ease that the director is there for you completely and that you can kind of do anything go out on a limb and try something and he'll be extremely supportive of that impulse so that's really cool Mm -hmm. and nicole kidman on the extra says that griffin is famous for the way he watches scenes because he acts them out he'll hate me for saying that but he does (laughs) so i guess he like like facially moves his you know his expressions around Mm -hmm. and goron who plays jimmy says (laughs) i tried to uh, like correct this But he goes, he probably kills me because of this. But, you know, (laughs) when he watches the monitor, you know, he's always, you know, start making faces, acting together with us. But he says that's so good because when you see him, you know, it's so easy for you to to be playful. He's trying to say he uh, is always on set full of energy and in a good mood. Goran says, I like that. You did an amazing Goran accent there. Thank you. I like how you're like uh, the uh, Nicole Kim. You're like, oh, I don't remember the Australian accent, but like Croatian. You he probably right. killed me for this. <laughs> Jelly donut with the cream. Jelly donut. <laughs> um, do you want to take the next couple? Sure. So this is uh, Denise Denovi. So she says, Griffin Dunn has had so many years of experience as an actor, as a producer. He understands the process so well. You see him working with the actors and you see the incredible chemistry he has with them, almost like actors have with each other. That's interesting. He was an actor before he was even a director. So like- right. He's part of that world. Like he knows what it takes to, I guess, be in the actor's position and having to work with the director. So he kind of like reversed, uh, engineered that whole process and was able to like really be there for these actors because he had those experiences before he was even a director. Yeah, he knew what was missing Mm -hmm. for sure. And he, he catered to what he wished he would have had. Right. He knew exactly what they needed as the actors. And mm-hmm. that's what made him such a great director. So um, Griffin said, I, I find there's just something so distasteful about seeing somebody in a position of authority run around like your head has been cut off. You know that we're all screaming and yelling. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're over budget and the sun is going. All this kind of hysteria is so not productive. It's really kind of great to be in a crowd where you're, yes, We know the sun is going down, we're trying to get it done, and the screaming and yelling doesn't help. He talks about always admiring Denovi's work and relationship with the directors she's worked with, especially Tim Burton. Griffin says he knew when he got a script from her that it was going to be great, a worthwhile project, that she really protected him and kept his chin up, and that there's never any panic or screaming or yelling. Nice. Yeah. Um, their working relationship was was really good. So uh, Griffin continues about working with Zenobi. I believe everything I shot. To be honest, you know, the actors are given such honest performances. Sort of one of my weaknesses that Denise helped me out with is she encouraged me to really put all this stuff back in, to put anything that felt overly sentimental from my point of view. She would say go farther because I had shot it and it was romantic and wanted to go back on it. And she encouraged me to go much further. And I would encourage her to relax into the darker elements of this material, which is something I felt more comfortable with. Practical magic on a technical level with the special effects, true special effects, computer generated and otherwise was far more complicated. So he compared this to his work on Addicted to Love. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know why it took so long. You know, it's very time consuming when you're shooting. It's very time consuming to see it. And then it's never right when you see it. It's not supposed to be. You're warned about that, but it is a little hair raising to go through the tests as it gets better and better and better as your release date gets closer and closer. It all pulled together. It all worked out great, but I didn't have these sort of problems on Addicted to Love. It's very different. 
My approach to directing and working with the actors really hadn't changed. I have such extraordinary actors and you know I really look for people who work hard, take their job really seriously but also have fun. You can take your job seriously but also love your death scene or the scene where you kill your mother. <laughs> I'm sort of into movies and roles where I'm surrounded by the kind of actor who not only doesn't mind going there but actually finds it fun to go to those places. I want to make sure that the actor always feels good at the end of the day about what they did. And I remember that the frustration I always had as an actor was I never felt satisfied. I felt like my own insecurity or lack of communication with the director, I was feeling a little incomplete. And if you go away from that day feeling that, God damn it, <laughs> wait, 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 hold on, it's <laughs> hard. And if you go away from that day feeling that way, you're going to bring it to the next day and just sort of escalate and suddenly you're not gonna have fun. You're worrying about the things that you shouldn't have to be worrying about. And you get in that frame of mind, you get all upset about everything and it never goes to what you should be thinking about. So I always had good dialogue with the actors and the cast. And that kind of reiterates what we were saying before, like he was such a good director because he's been in that actor's position of feeling unsatisfied and mm -hmm. like the directors just didn't get him or didn't know how to like work with him so that he felt that satisfaction at the end of the day. Right, 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 right. Do you want to take the margarita scene? I'd love to. All right. So <laughs> through the commentary, the margarita scene comes up and he says, I think my favorite scene of the movie, it was the most fun to shoot was the margarita scene. The idea of that came out of Denise, who says these things every now and then about the show business truism of that. She said, if you have these women in a movie, you have to have a scene where they sing and dance now. And then he chuckles, really? Think of how are these witches going to sing and dance? I mean, it's not Oliver, you know? <laughs> it's not a musical, but I understood what she meant, you know? <laughs> we have another, who the, fucking Louis L'Amour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the example she gave uh, from one of her movies was the song Deo from Beetlejuice. Great scene. Mm -hmm. Which was, of course, a musical scene in and of itself. And then the Midnight Margarita scene was always in, but not necessarily like a big dance scene. The girls went crazy and I didn't know what the song was going to be. And then I remember this Lime in the Coconut, this Harry Nielsen song, which I loved so much when it first came out. So it amused me so much to use a song that meant so much to me years ago when I was a teenager and have that be the sort of centerpiece of the sequence did you hear that song before this movie no me either <laughs> really <laughs> yeah. i've never heard this song before i always just know it as the practical magic midnight margarita song you know yes absolutely like, he, he made it he gave it it's like new he life. gave it a new life yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's another harry nielsen song did you watch the show russian doll yes yes that that intro song is another harry nielsen yeah, yeah, song yeah dude whenever sometimes when i'm waking up because it, i forget gotta how to get up gotta, gotta get, get out <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, like, <laughs> after me and Avi, like, binge that show, uh -huh. every time, like, we would, like, have to, like, get up and get going, like, I would sing that song. That's going on WMSR. Such a good song. It's, like, yeah. it's a bop. Yeah, yeah. It is a bop. Yeah, I didn't know that was Harry Nielsen, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, he's got some catchy ones. And uh -huh. you, you don't really, like, know that they're him. They're he's... really different. Like, Lime and the Coconut in that song? Yeah. I would never have known. Right. And he's not, like, this mainstream act that, like, you would even no it was him like his signature sound but yeah like you said every one of his songs has like a completely different sound I, but he's got I a know lot of about ones. him i'd love to do a, a deep dive oh, on him we should yeah i mean we could just do okay like we'll highlight maybe that song but we should do a whole harry nielsen episode oh 100 percent. Okay. okay cool cool, cool. Yeah. i think so we should do that for all of the artists on the soundtrack okay yeah keeps us in business i know right we're gonna so start running out of topics at some point i know don't say that he says right. I wanted them to be dancing and singing to this song as we hear it because I guess he explains like usually you kind of lip sync it and then they dub it in and you know but he says this causes editorial nightmarish problems but I thought about the spirit of the song and I thought I'm just gonna shoot it capture the energy and I'll worry about it later <laughs> he sounds like you yeah he must be a such wait what was his He's birthday a Gemini He's a Gemini well same thing Sister sign. <laughs> Sister sign. <laughs> um, he said, we'll worry about it later. And we cut up the song and it jumps all over the place, but it gets the energy of what I was seeing when I was shooting, which was a totally magical day. And Sandy says in the scene in which she's stammering and stuttering, trying not to lie to Gary, she, she kidnapped him. Cause, and then, and then, and then it was she, you know, what the matter was that she, she was <laughs> channeling the cadence of Griffin. <laughs> and Denovi agrees with that and says that his brain is either three steps ahead or three steps behind of what he's saying. 
thing. And I feel that so hard. It was just kind of like a little, like a little nap. Wait, wait. So is this a Gemini thing then? <laughs> I guess our airy minds are just like, Bye. yeah, it's so funny. That's so funny that that was who she was channeling in that scene. Like, I don't think I've ever read that quote anywhere, but that's hilarious to <laughs> come to know that now. I feel it. I feel uh -huh. it. And then it gets, and then all the air gets like lifted out of the room when Nicole's like, what is wrong with you? And yeah, then it's yeah. like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So cute. So Griffin is talking about Elizabeth Lang, who is the casting associate and editor. He's talking about the editing process. He says, when we had done Addictive to Love together and we had mutual friends in common, she'd never done anything before this. I had just an intuitive feeling that she and I would get along with one another and she would be right for this material. I did not want to hire a comedy editor necessarily. I wanted to hire someone with a great sense of humor and irony and could also keep the storyline. So we had very good success working together. And I guess when I came off a movie that I had been directing, I get a little animated <laughs> when I talk to the actors and it somehow carries its way over into the editing room. You know what Beth and I do is I talk about the movie that I just finished doing. She'll do an assembly and then I'll see it, go through the custom of a director having a nervous breakdown, then walk <laughs> away from it, then come back in and we go through the movie scene by scene by scene. And I just talk and talk my way through it what I was picturing and this is what I meant and this is what I wish and, you know etc and she writes everything down and I just talk and this process takes about a week <laughs> it's as if we never met people we just take that that approach uh, we had to work extraordinarily long hours to get the film ready I'm a bit of a night owl and I actually like working at night so we would work very late into the night and by after we've gotten to a certain point where we have you know the cut where she wants it I come in and then we continue to work on it and then I pretty much stay in the editing room and from that point on to the rest of the movie she and i are in the editing room and you spend a lot of time with your editor and director the editor director relationship is you know very personal you know <laughs> it's very private you know you have to trust this person so much and she knows so much about me and i know so much about her and all we're really talking about is this movie but talking about the movie and all the themes that we're really talking about ourselves oh okay does that make sense yeah I get what he said. Their relationship must have been like you need a lot of trust for sure. Mm -hmm. It's such an intimate environment. Every time somebody would come in the room, our necks would snap around like, "Who are you?" You know, you you were caught in the middle of a conversation. Like, what do you want? I guess they, <laughs> anytime somebody would come in the room, like, "What? What?" Yeah, and they would yeah. just kind of sneak in, like, "Oh, I just need to get this." And that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, nobody was greeted with any joy at all. It's like, what do you want? You have to be completely focused, you know. And it was just a very good partnership. Right. But lastly, in the commentary he says that the most difficult scene to film would have been the days in which he was shooting the exorcism he says because it was so intense and required all the actors to become extremely emotional which in the final cut i pulled back i pulled back a lot from where they really went in their performances it just kind of became too much i mean it was brilliant i just remember coming away that day and just the way i felt drained for all of us it was very very emotional I can only imagine like how draining that is to go to those places mm -hmm. to film a scene. Mm -hmm. Like think about think about how how Justina comes away from talking with a special guest and I need two days of recovery time. Like a positive interview and an interaction, never mind watching somebody go to a right. a dark place. A dark place for yeah, take. Absolutely. Take. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna talk about Griffin Dunn's nineteen ninety eight interview about the movie. Practical Magic with Bobby Wygant. And this yep. is from the Bobby Wygant archive. And this whole video is uh, up on the YouTube channel. And she also has the same kind of interview that all of the cast and crew from this movie were kind of doing in promotion for the movie. So right. there's interviews for Sandra Bullock. There's interviews. I think I saw the Diane Weist one. And you know then one there isn't is Nicole. Nicole, there's not one for her. Was there one for Stalker? I think so. Okay. And then there's also one for Gora. I think I saw his. Okay. So this is from that interview, and this is the interview with Griffin. During the interview, Griffin Dunn discusses the challenges and creative decisions behind the special effects in the film. So one particular scene involves six witches flying, which initially was shot beautifully with the actresses in harnesses and umbrellas. However, upon editing, it was decided that the flying effect was too extravagant and broke the practicality of magic. So instead, the decision was made to show the witches floating with glimpses of how they got there. Dunn 
Sean mentions that they shot the flying scenes for several days without any midair collisions and the young girls in the film enjoyed the harnesses and wire work. I love that they weren't flying. It's just yeah. like kind of like a Mary Poppins. Yes. Down. Uh-huh. That's with the cool. umbrellas too, right? Yeah. I don't even know if he realized that he paid an homage to the Mary Poppins thing with the umbrella. But I love that comparison. Dunn humorously shares that they shot the flying scenes for four days but ended up using the floating cut. And then maybe that's why they're in a different order when they get to the bottom. Oh, maybe. Remember yeah. in the Goofs and yeah. Trivia episode we, we noticed that? Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why because they did shoot them on different days and then he ended up using the floating stuff instead of the... Uh, the flying stuff. Mm -hmm. The conversations then shifts to casting Nicole Kidman and the concerns about her availability due to her previous film, Eyes Wide Shut. Dunn admits to being nervous, but ultimately everything worked out as planned. The interviewer brings up the idea of having two sets of actresses, Kidman and Sandra Bullock, and Diane Weiss and Stalker Channing in the film, potentially creating competition between them. Dunn acknowledges the perception, but doesn't delve further into the topic. The interview concludes with Dunn expressing his love for filmmaking and the joy he finds in seeing the behind-the-scenes work that goes into creating magical moments on screen. The conversation continues with the mention of the children and animals being involved in the film. The interviewer, Bobby Wygant, asks if Griffin Dunn felt overwhelmed by the various elements pulling him in different directions. She must be referring to the critics uh, bashing it for being all different sorts of things. So Dunn explains that he had a great time making the movie and didn't find it threatening or difficult. He mentions being raised by strong women and feeling comfortable with the dynamic. He recalls a more intense day of shooting with 13 women in the coven scene, but overall it was a fun experience. The interviewer further probes if there was competition or tension among the actors regardless of age or gender. Dunn responds that there wasn't any competition and highlights the incredible chemistry between Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kimmon, who effortlessly portrayed the bond of sisters. He emphasizes that for everyone to look good, they had to work together and bring out the best in each other. Dunn expresses his gratitude for the perfect chemistry among the cast. The interview wraps up with a congratulations and well wishes for the film's success. There was some banter about the candles in the background, and Dunn jokingly mentions weaving a spell. Mm. Both parties express appreciation and say their goodbyes. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see the full interview, it's going to be linked. It's on YouTube. Just type in Griffin Dunn Practical Magic, and it's probably one of the first interviews that comes up. Yeah. It looks like it's from 98. Just pick that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll also link it in the hero source notes. Gwyn Watkins wrote this article for Yahoo Entertainment on October 27, 2017, which is pretty recent. Pretty recent, yeah. Yeah. Gwyn asks Griffin Dunn, what's your biggest, do you want, should we read this like uh, a Dan Rather style? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's your biggest memory of making the film? How beautiful that location was, Friday Harbor, and building this house that we had to tear down the day after shooting. The set was magical, you know? There'd be dolphins and whales just watching us filming. So it was a really pleasant, easygoing shoot, and Sandy and Nicole remain friends. Yeah, it's a really good memory. What was it like shooting the climactic exorcism scene? That was kind of intense. It was me and 12 possessed women for, <laughs> it took about a week or so to shoot it. And I think they were all in the same moon cycle. They were all <laughs> menstruating at the same time. That happens. That right. happens when women hang out a lot. Absolutely. They all sync up. So yeah, it was truly in the land of the women there. And you know, Nicole never does anything halfway. She wanted to bang her head on the floor. And I remember when we laid down the floor, we weren't sure where she was going to land. So rubber panels, rubber wood strips were laid out. And I just remember her take after take slamming her head. She looked totally possessed. I mean, I think she brought on a rash. Her skin would go bright red from white to red to white and waves of, you know, purging. It was intense. Wow. The yeah. relationship between the two leads and between their aunts is so lovely and believable. Did you rehearse with them beforehand or do anything to encourage that bond? We did certainly rehearse. I think they all understood instinctually how to do that. It was a deliberate choice to have the two sets of sisters not look anything alike. And somehow in the world of witches, that had witch logic to it. <laughs> you know, one of the most fun days we had was the last shot of the day in Friday Harbor. We were all going to go to the soundstage in Los Angeles afterward, where we shot the girls all drinking tequila and they became nuts in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what we drank? We all drank tequila and shot that scene. Thank God the DP didn't have any, but we shot it and they all went nuts and we all danced around. I think Lime in the Coconut was going. And then we wrapped the scene, but kept drinking and dancing to Lime in the Coconut. Oh, how fun. 
Have you ever noticed Practical Magic gaining a following over the years? Yeah, even though it made its money back and it made a profit, the movie was not considered a success at the time. And I took a bit of a hit as a director, and Warner Brothers was a little weird about it, you know? So I was kind of in a director's jail for a while. Wow. I could never quite figure out what that was about. But what I have noticed is every woman I've dated since just loves that movie and goes on and on about it. It's kind of grown and grown in appreciation, which I'm really happy about. <laughs> That's a shame. It like, is. Director's jail for one of the best movies. Director's jail. <laughs> Straight to jail. Straight to jail. Oh, uh, so here, let's talk about that witch consultant that we were talking about earlier that uh, yeah. I guess backfired. Yeah. Um, this article is from www.avclub.com. And it says, Practical Magic is a perfectly fine late 90s rom-com with two charismatic leads, Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman. And strong supporting turns by Stalker Channing and Diane Weist, and the added fun of witchcraft against the backdrop of a lovely seaside town. Yet the movie got lousy reviews. It topped out at 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, which led to less than stellar box office returns. The actresses involved all bounced back in short order, but the directing career of Griffin Dunn, who was attempting to move behind the camera after acting in movies like After Hours and American Werewolf in London, never really recovered. In an interview with Vulture, Dunn now reveals while making Practical Magic, he hired a witch consultant. He says, I had my producer make her a reservation at a nice hotel, and the witch goes, you're not going to buy me off with a hotel room. I want a percentage of the movie. I'm going to have my own Practical Magic cookbook. She was paid quite well and says, I want an additional $250,000. The producer told her that that's not possible. She just goes crazy and scares the shit out of the producer. And she says, I'm going to put a curse on you. I'm going to put a curse on the whole movie. And I'm putting a curse on Griffin. The witch then left a voicemail message in which she spoke in tongues, making for her audio so scary that neither Dunn nor the studio's legal department could bear to listen to the whole thing, apparently. Oh my God. So maybe Practical Magic would have bombed anyway, but who really knows? For his part, Dunn eventually became so wary that he hired an exorcist to rid him of the supposed curse. Just to cover my tracks, I did have a little bit of an exorcism. <laughs> How do you have like a little bit, like a, just like yeah. a little like whisper of an exorcism? Just, just a nonchalant exorcism. Yeah. A little, a little exorcism. Yeah. I hired someone to get that person off my radar. While I didn't give it too much power, I'm open-minded enough to at least spend a hundred bucks on an exorcism. <laughs> I like how you said, like, a little, little exorcism, like, a little nap, like, Sally. Yeah, a little said. nap. A little nap. Yeah. I want, like, we talked about this briefly on the Goose and Trivia episode. Like, I want to know how this lady got this job. Where did they find her from? I know. Did they not, like, vet her? Did they not do, like, a psychiatric evaluation before? Right, right. That, like, there was there no contract? Right. Ahead of time? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, now he knows better. Yeah. So it says, Dunn is in the midst of a comeback as of late and well-received turns on the show like I Love Dick and The House of Lies and as the director of an upcoming documentary about the writer Joan Didion. That's his aunt, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he noticed that his once reviled film is having a bit of a resurgence as well. When my daughters were in their late teens, I started to notice that their friends loved the movie and quoted the movie and would freak out when they found out that her father directed the movie. I watched it grow and grow and it's been very touching and unexpected. I've gone out with women who have watched this movie every year with their daughters and it's a lovely kind of surprise. Hey, Griffin, did you know that there was a Practical Magic Fandom podcast? Do you know you have like a ton of witches in your corner? Yeah. Hey, Griffin, can you answer Christina's DMs, please? <laughs> <laughs> and tell Gordon and Roman and Williams to do the same thing. Um, Christina, did you see the thing I tagged you in on our Yes. Instagram? Oh my god, the clickety clack that the clickety clacking of the nails and that lady and the, the text on her gum. It, the text above it is just like sliding into celebrities' DMs acting like they've been your friend for years or something like that. And I'm like, oh my god, this is giving Christina energy. <laughs> I was dying. It's perfect. <gasps> oh, that's so you. Uh, no qualms. Hashtag Gemini life. That's right. <laughs> Everyone's your friend. That's right. All right. So this next article is another interview with Griffin as he talks about the Practical Magic Director's Cut. Mm -hmm. um, this is by Kristen Lopez, and this article is from CultureS.com. Kristen asks, now I have to ask what's different in the Practical Magic Director's Cut. So this... This is in 2020, this interview? It said three years ago. So I'm guessing three years ago from now in 2020? Yeah. yeah, I guess that would, I guess that would make sense. So Griffin says, they, talking about the studio, wanted to really soften the edges. When the villain is on the table with the needle in the eyes, yeah, that went a lot farther. 
can we speculate like what does what what would have been farther than that first of all can you imagine having the director's cut of this movie that, that comes out of this project like being able to see like all the crazy shit i'm picturing though like the needles in his eyes and then his eyes start moving around and like the needles are like moving all over the place yeah yeah is this okay so the director's cut is that the one that akiva what's is what's his name akiva gold goldman is that the one that he had that he said was lost forever i guess i don't know like is this floating around somewhere we gotta get we gotta we pressure get him to find that cut we need to you know who we need to call david spellman baker because he probably <laughs> he's probably got it he does yeah um hey, david, hey what's up david um, so he goes on to say, jumping off the roof, that was an extended moment to music and it was a very elegiac moment. There are certain things I was forced to cut. What the fuck? I was forced to cut. Hold on. I'm going to edit this real quick. Uh, yeah. I just copied and pasted this. So this is the article fucking up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are just certain things that I was forced to cut down on that I think softened it a little bit. I'm very proud of the movie. But if it ever got too scary, I said, but the scene is scary, isn't it? That is a scary scene. But I guess apparently the studio didn't want it to go that dark. So they softened it a little bit, which is probably why we have such a mod podge of genres going on. Mm -hmm. Because he was trying to appease the studio and not make it as horror or as scary, which is what it sounds like it initially was. I wonder if Alice would have been more on his side. Like, yeah, let's like you and I were just talking about Anne Rice because we watched the the Stevie Nicks thing. I'm wondering if she would have been like, okay, like let us kind of play with the idea of practical magic being darker. And that is his, he's used to being in more dark films and directing dark films. Yeah. Um, I think that's why it might appeal now more to a broader age range you know it's it's safer it's a safer choice for because a studio it is, it is so many other things not just the horror mm -hmm. and because griffin dunn is such a comedic he's got that like animated kind of personality he's done comedy before he's just he knows how to bring that comedy and charm to a dark topic situation yeah situation yeah, yeah. yeah. so i think he did it beautifully i know the movie got a lot of hate for that but mm -hmm. Fuck the critics again what do they know like i love it to me it's kind of realistic yeah because life is all those things right life is all those things yeah exactly. like one minute you you just don't know like i like an unpredictable plot twist movie. yeah plot twist plot twist yeah Micro. love it that's all that was practical magic related for that interview yeah so let's talk about thomas tommy griffin himself <laughs> uh again he was born on june 8th 1955 he is a gemini we should do his chart. Ooh. I'd be interested. Yeah. Um, he's an American actor, film producer, and film director. Ben studied acting at the Neighborhood Playhouse School of the Theater in New York City. I think he's like a New York native, isn't he? Is he? He's like he's like New York, New York. I'm New pretty sure. New York. All right. Um, and he's known for portraying Jack Goodman in An American Werewolf in London, 1981, and Paul Hackett in After Hours in 1985 for which he is nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. I think I saw American Werewolf in London. I was just going to ask. I don't remember After Hours. Yeah, I don't think I've seen either one. I think I've seen clips of American Werewolf, but I never saw the entire movie. We should add that to our movie list, movie night. On it. <laughs> yeah. Is that a comedy or is that supposed to be so. horror? I think it's kind of like a Griffin Dunn movie. It's a just dark comedy. A little bit of both, right? Yeah. All right. Talking about his early life, Thomas Griffin Dunn was born in New York City to Ellen Beatrice and Dominic Dunn. Dunn has Irish and Mexican ancestry. His father was born and raised in an Irish Catholic family and his maternal grandfather, an Irish American, and his maternal grandmother, a Mexican who was from Sonora, Mexico. He's the older brother of Alexander and Dominique Dunn. His mother founded the Victims Rights Organization, Justice for Homicide Victims, after his sister Dominique's murder in 1982. His father was a producer, writer, and actor. He is also a nephew of writers John Gregory Dunn and Joan Didion. Raised in Los Angeles, Dunn attended the Fay School in Southboro, Massachusetts, and then went to Fountain Valley School in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where he developed an interest in acting, appearing in many school plays. He was scheduled to perform in a school production of Othello when on the eve of the performance, a teacher found him smoking marijuana. <laughs> Dunn was immediately expelled and moved back to New York soon afterwards to pursue his acting interests. 
he studied acting at the neighborhood playhouse school of the theater under sanford meisner so would he be considered a nepo baby i would think so yeah yeah um not necessarily that he might have had things handed to him but he had the opportunities there that certainly made things a lot easier he was surrounded by other actors and producers within his family right he was born into all of that so Mm -hmm. it was just maybe took a natural course yeah yeah um a little bit about his acting so dunn began his professional acting career at age 19 with a small supporting role in The Other Side of the Mountain in 1975. He has since appeared on both film and television, starring in An American Werewolf in London in 1981 as Jack Goodman, Johnny Dangerously in 1984 as Tommy Kelly, After Hours in 1985 as Paul Hackett, Who's That Girl in 1987 as Ludin Trott opposite Madonna, and My Girl in 1991 as Jake Bixler. I don't remember him in My Girl. Who's Jake? Is he the poet at the end? I don't know. It's been so long since I saw that. Remember at the end of that movie? Sad movie. Oh my God. So fucking sad. But do you remember at the movie when her name was Veda, right? When she wants to be a poet and she takes that poetry class? Do you remember? I'm going to add it to the list. Girl, I I probably was eight years old the last time I saw this movie. Yeah. I I vaguely remember him as maybe the teacher or the the, the poetry professor when she takes that poetry class at the end. Okay. thinking it that that's him but i'm not 100 percent sure also haven't seen that movie in ages also he was on the quiz show in 1994 as gerital account executive game six in 2005 as elliot litvak and i like it like that in 1994 as stephen price dunn also played dr vass opposite matthew mcconaughey in the oscar nominated 2013 film dallas buyers club Dunn's TV appearances include Frasier, the pilot episode The Good Son, as Caller Russell, and in season 3 episode 11, The Friend, as Bob. Oh, he was on Saturday Night Live. Did you see his little clip on Saturday Night Live? No. It's it really good? cute. It's so f- he's he's Was he a presenter or something? Yeah, he did like a opening monologue and he did like oh. a little little dance number. I think he oh. like with like some surf rock or something. Like I think he was pretending to surf or like do something like that it was pretty funny like in that whole monologue you can really see his personality and kind of like what a goofball he is i want to see it cool it's really cute also he was on alias and law and order criminal intent episodes 5 118 and 128 he portrayed tony mink in the comedy trust me on tnt in 2012 dunn guest starred as management consultant marco pelios in seven episodes of the premiere season of the showtime tv series house of lies in 2018, he joined the cast of This Is Us, where he starred as Nikki Pearson, Jack Pearson's brother, until the series concluded in 2022. I actually never watched This Is Us. Did you watch that, that I show No, at all? I didn't, but I love Milo Ventimiglia. He's in that, right? And Mandy Moore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Milo, we know him from Gilmore Girls, right? Didn't he play Jesse? Yes. Oh, yes. Team Jesse. Yes. Jess. <laughs> Jess. That's right. Jess. So in regards to his producing, in 1995, Griffin Dunn was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film for Duke of Groove, which he directed and co-wrote. He shared the nomination with producer Thom Colwell, along with his producing partner, actress, and producer, Amy Robinson. He has produced several films, including Baby It's You, After Hours, Running on Empty, and Game Six through their company, Double Play Productions. In 1986, the company had signed an agreement with Metro Gold- MGM uh, for a two-year production agreement. You know, Dunn's- I never knew what, what MGM stood for. It stands for Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Mm-hmm. Look at that. I learned something new. <laughs> uh, Dunn's directorial debut was in the 1995 short film Duke of Groove. Since then, he has directed five feature films at the time of this writing, including Addicted to Love in 97 and Practical Magic in 98. He also directed, I'm wondering, sorry, I'm wondering how long, like how do directors, do they take a time off if Addicted to Love happened in 97 and then like, did he just jump right into Practical Magic in 98? You know, Maybe. I'm interested. Yeah. He also directed one segment of the 2012 anthology movie, Movie 43. Did you see that one? No. That was a weird-ass movie. Was it? What was it about? I think it's the movie with all of those, like, A-list actors that's kind of really awkward, really crude. Let me double check. It's just weird. It's real weird. <laughs> it's just weird. I don't even think I've heard of it. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. It had it had, um, uh, Kristen Bell, ha- Halle Berry, Gerard Butler, Seth MacFarlane, Leslie Bibb, Leslie Bibb oh, um, sure. Anna Ferris, Hugh Jackman, Johnny Knoxville, Justin Long, Chloe Grace, Chris Pratt, Julianne Moore, Tony Shalhoub, Kate Winslet. Hey, Titanic. It's all connected. It's all connected. Look at that. Tons Um, of actors. Super weird. 
That is super weird. So he directed one segment of that film. Yes. How many? So I guess it's a film like different vignettes. I like, think so. Yeah. Did you ever see um, what's that movie? The one about uh, not love actually. Something like Love in New York or something like that. Mm -mm. There's it's like different vignettes, lots of A list celebrities. Cool. But like there are different segments of the movie where like each one has their own little storyline. So I'm wondering if it's kind of like that. That reminds me of have you seen the TikTok trend of like the Princess Bride home movies and it's different no. actors shooting different scenes of Princess Bride, like all A list actors shooting Princess Bride scenes and then they clipped it all together. It's so it's so funny. It's really no, cute. That sounds amazing. Now I have to go search that on TikTok. <laughs> so um he produced and directed his Aunt Joan Didion documentary called The Center Will Not Hold in 2017. Yeah. I don't know anything about her. Me either. I think we go into her a lot later. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. So a little bit about his personal life. Don was married to American actress Carrie Lowell, with whom he has one daughter, actress Hannah Dunn, and he was married to Carrie from 1989 to 1995. He then married Anne Benjamin, an Australian stylist in July 2009. And as far as we know, he's still married to her, right? As far as we know. Okay. So we're going to talk about some of Griffin Dunn's notable credits. So this includes movies, this includes television, and also some of his notable awards and nominations. Okay. So he started his acting career, like, I guess, officially in 1975, because that's the first one that's documented mm -hmm. or he's credited as an actor. Mm -hmm. He started his career with The Other Side of the Mountain, and he played Herbie Johnson. Then the next notable role he had was in 1981, where he played Jack Goodman in An American Werewolf in London. And he was in tons of movies between then and his next role, which we just talked about, 1991's My Girl, where he played Mr. Jake Bixler, which I'm pretty certain it might be that poetry professor at the very end of the movie. 1987 he starred in who's that girl and he played ludon trot and who's that girl also starred madonna i probably saw that movie ages ago i don't remember anything about oh. it but okay. yeah but that's a madonna movie i wanted to talk a little bit about this 1996 film joe's apartment okay what is this he actually produced this he did not act in this at all but you might christina you might be a little too young to remember this on mtv but you might okay. remember it's okay so on mtv back in early 90s before this movie even came out this started off as an mtv short so basically in between i guess music videos or like blocks of different shows mm -hmm. they would air these little animated shorts this wasn't an animation completely but this did involve stop animation cockroaches basically <laughs> this guy joe he lives in this apartment in new york city his apartment's disgusting He's okay. a bachelor, but he dates women and he brings them back and he tries to like romance them. And you know, his dating life sucks because of these roaches, but these roaches are actually his friend, but they in essence end up ruining every single relationship he tries to have because oh he's like, he, before he brings these girls back, he's like, all right, I told you don't come out when I'm having this date, I'm having a date tonight. <laughs> don't come out. Just That's hide. So you need to hide and you need, you know what you need to do. But these roaches would always end up coming out and fucking up his date somehow. And roaches. Yeah. And it was like a little stop animation kind of short. And that's Ew. how it started. That's how it started. But in 1996, they actually made a whole entire movie surrounding up. this plot. Starring oh Jerry O'Connell and Megan Ward. I gotta look it up. The plot on this Wikipedia okay. page. So Joe's Apartment is a 1996 American musical black comedy film written and directed by John Payson in his feature directorial debut based on his 1992 short film of the same name and starring Jerry O'Connell and Megan Ward. The first MTV Films production, it was the only one not to involve Paramount Pictures. It was also the first film Blue Sky Studios was involved in. The main focus of the story is the fact that, unbeknownst to many humans, cockroaches can talk, but prefer not to as humans smush first and ask questions later. They also sing and even have their own public access television <laughs> cable TV channel. Actors providing the Roaches' voices included Billy West in his feature film debut, Jim Turner, Rick Aviles, this is his final film role before his death, and uh, Tim Blake Nelson, B.D. Wong, and Dave Chappelle. 
The film received generally negative reviews from critics, and it was a box office failure. Okay, it is firstly, so this cheesy. looks like like body snatchers or something like that. Like the cover <laughs> is so kitschy, uh-huh. um, but it reminds me of like the aliens from Men in Black, or mm-hmm. like the like the roach things that are just like drinking coffee and talking yeah. about the water cooler. You know, that's like, basically what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah like scary. a mystery science theater three thousand kind of vibe. Yeah, it's so cheese, but I mean, like it's a, it was a moment in time. It definitely, Joe's apartment, I remember seeing that, like, live on TV back in the early 90s. Did you ever watch the movie or just the shorts? I think I did watch the movie, like, when it came out, but this movie's so old. It's like one of those movies, it's just lost in time. Yeah, so he's credited with the shorts within the MTV thing, but not really with the movie that came out of it, No, right? he No, he did the movie. He pro- I think he, okay. produced, he produced the movie. Yeah, I don't think he did the shorts on the MTV. I think once it became the movie, that's, that's when he was involved with it. But he's not credited, though. Produced by Diane Phillips and Bonnie Lee. On the IMDb page? On or- this Wikipedia link. Oh, interesting. So I wonder um, if he did it for the MTV and not this. This says, what year did this, does this say years? 90, the movie is 96. Okay, maybe it was, because I clicked on, I clicked on the link right from the Wikipedia, that graph, because it has links for all the movies. So when I open that link, that links me right to the movie. Right. But it doesn't list him on this page? That yeah, that's sense. weird. It's like, yeah, I did a, I did a search too. I don't see him. Interesting. Let's see. Let's go. I'm to- wondering. Yeah, let's check the. TV, the TV show. They could have just linked the wrong. Right. The wrong one. He's credited on IMDb. Okay. All right. Yeah. He's on the IMDb page. Maybe they just forgot to put him in the wiki page. Wiki, wiki. Wiki, wiki. So yeah, so that's that's what the uh, the show slash movie was about. It was about those cockroaches. Cockroaches. So funny. Um, I think there's some clips still on YouTube, like old original Joe's Apartment clips from MTV, like the shorts. Okay. We're going to link those down below, you guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then next up, we have Addicted to Love, and he was just a producer on that. Oh, no, I'm sorry, director. So his Um, first directing debut was also in 96 with Duke of Groove, and then Practical Magic was only his third directing film. That's crazy. It is. So Sandra Bullock, she kind of went to him with the idea to direct the movie yeah it sounded like that because they were like who can embody this whimsical nature she i guess yeah because she had it first right they just didn't have a director so did she help she didn't help produce practical magic did she i don't think she produced i don't i don't know i don't know i want to say a cool little easter egg it's all connected moment is that he's also credited on here with oceans eight which she was in (gasps) that's right isn't that cool yeah wait what did he do when he produced oceans eight he was an actor oh okay so he had like a little cameo so they got to act together he was a parole board officer okay i'm wondering because oceans eight was also like another like star-studded a-list like all those different was it the women it was the woman's oceans movie right yeah wasn't rihanna in that too like there was like a bunch of a-listers i haven't seen Um, it i want to aaron and i we go through these phases where we're like okay we're gonna watch (laughs) Not necessarily bad, like, trilogies or, or series, yeah. but, like, we watched all the, like, Riddick movies. Okay. We watched all, like, the fucking Rambo movies, and we were trying to watch all the Oceans movies, and uh-huh. we, we didn't watch Oceans 8. Oh, we watched good. The, all the other previous ones, Um, so I do want to watch this movie. I love anything Sandra Bullock is in. I didn't realize Griffin Dunn was in the movie, but, like, I'm wondering if they had a scene opposite each other, because there are so many other celebrities. I'm wondering if she was in the scene that he was in, which would Right. Cool. I, I would love... I would hope so. That would be neat. Yeah. Right. So it's interesting that Practical Magic only being his third directorial gig, mm-hmm. that Sandra would entrust him with such a project because mm-hmm. he didn't really have much directorial experience under his belt before then. Right. It looked like he helped produce quite a few other, you know, movies before this, but as a director, she's like she just liked his style, I guess, his acting style and his producing style. She's like, "Yep, him. He's the guy. He's their guy." <laughs> So um, there's he's got a long list of credits here. Let's see, what else has he directed? Lisa Pikert is famous. Fierce People, Your Product Here, uh, The Accidental Husband, Movie 43, Dallas Buyers Club. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, not Dallas Buyers Club. He was just an actor in it. Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, and Within Volume 2. 
So he's got he's got some act, uh, directorial stuff under his belt, but he acted a lot more than he's directed. Mm-hmm. Were there any other notable ones that you you're picking out that he's acted in? Through his television, the only ones that I know from TV are like the Alfred Hitchcock Presents. He was in an episode called The Jar, and he played Noel. Frasier was on, very popular in the 90s. He was in a couple of Frasier episodes, Alias, Law and Order. Um, I haven't watched The Good Wife. Girls, very recent. I mean, I say very recent. 2013. Seems <laughs> like yesterday. Uh-huh. Um, the League and This Is Us was the ones that stuck out to me. Right. Yeah. And so what he, about you? Any other ones on that list? No, I don't watch a lot of TV. Like I'm not really into the law shows, which he seems like he's been in a mm-hmm. few Law and Order episodes. And mm-hmm. also I'm not very into sitcoms like Frasier. Like I'm not into like laugh track shows. Yeah. Super cheese. So I don't remember seeing him on any um, television or anything, but I did watch that Saturday Night Live appearance when he did the monologue. Um, to check it out. Yeah, so go check that out. That was from 1986. So that oh was a God. long a while ago. Free practical magic. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Young, young man. He's so young. Handsome guy. He's a handsome guy. He kind of like has like a Martin Short kind of thing going on, but like younger Martin Short, like a goofy, just silly mm-hmm. comedy, but can do dark comedy. Mm-hmm. He just has that kind of like slapstick kind of appeal to him i don't know i don't know how to i like that there's a little bit of that in practical magic just a little Uh little slapstick just a little bit yeah so he's yeah he he's got a really really fun personality and i can only imagine working with him as an actor oh even just watching him on the like behind the scenes stuff when him and sal or sandy are like just like messing with each other it's Uh very sweet but then he he clips it he's like okay let's get to work and like off they go right yeah keeps it in order but has fun what he said what he said in like a lot of his interviews like it's serious you take your job seriously but there also has to be some play Mm -hmm. you know you gotta love you gotta love what you do otherwise what's the point and picking the right editors the right producers like to help him along he knows like he does like he said i don't want to be running around shouting you know with my head cut off yeah. That's not helping anybody. So he so- it sounds like he deliberately chooses producers and actors right. who keep their shit straight. Yeah, it helps to have a team around you who know what the fuck they're doing because then mm-hmm. it makes your job as a director a lot easier. Um, I have to say, judging by who he's worked with, he has an excellent judge of character. He's only slipped the once where he hired that, witch. that witch. <laughs> but but hey, we all we all have a um a slip of uh a judgment, slip, slip of judgment. Slip, slip of judgment, exactly. Yeah. We're all human. Yeah. The only other thing I can think of that you and I talked about, I think in the trivia thing, is that because Nicole Kidman had just worked with Martin Scorsese, the only other like kind of I guess difficult thing that he had to deal with on set was her needing to take so many takes. Mm-hmm. Where Sally fucking Sal- she's always Sally Owens to me. Sandra only had to take, you know, four. Five. Sa- Sally Bullock. Sandra Sally Bullock. Owens. Sandra Owens. Owen. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go over his awards really quick because okay. he has been nominated for quite a few things and he's won quite a few things between 86 and 2013. 2014 this man has done so many movies and i'm so happy that like he gets that recognition because his stuff is wonderful Mm -hmm. so in 86 for his movie after hours he was nominated for best actor in a motion picture for a golden globe but he won best feature for the independent spirit award then in 1994 for the movie love matters he was nominated for best actor in a movie or miniseries for the cable ace award and then 1996 for duke of Groove. He was nominated for Best Short Film Live Action through the Academy Award Association. In 1996, he was nominated for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Comedy Series. In 2000, he was nominated Uncertain Regard Award. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Uh, at the Cannes Film Festival for Lisa Picard is Famous. Also in 2000, for the same film, he won Pioneer Filmmaker in the Deep Alum Film Festival. In 2013, for the movie Discoveries, he won in two categories. The one at the Sedona International Film Festival for Outstanding Actor and one at the Sarasota Film Festival for Achievement in Acting. And then he also won for that crazy-ass movie, Movie 43. He actually won... For worst director, what at the Golden Raspberry Award in 2014 for that movie? Oh my god! We're gonna click on that real quick. Worst director, yeah. It's an award presented at the annual Golden Raspberry Awards to the worst director of the previous year. Oh, the following is a list of nominees. Okay, 
Oh, that I don't know if I'd want to win that. That is a slap in the face. But hey, he won something. I guess. <laughs> Might as well give him a participation award. That would be it's, better. It's like the whole like no no press is bad press. Press is press, right? So like as an award, an award, put it like, on your resume, Griffin. If if you're getting an award for being a shit director, it's still an award. Yeah, but I don't think he's a bad director. He did Practical Magic. We love that movie. He can do no wrong. He can do no wrong. Exactly. All right, give me some cool and fun facts about Mr. Tommy Griffin. Dunn. <laughs> Mr. Tommy Griff. T. Griff. T. Griff. So, <laughs> so these are from the... T. His, Griff Dizzle. Uh, T. Griff Dizzle. <laughs> these are from the trivia section on his IMDb page. So his best friend since childhood, guess who? Who? Carrie fucking Fisher. <gasps> Miss What's Princess that? Leia herself. Princess. She's a Disney princess. Yeah. Uh, he reminisced with her on the documentary Bright Lights about taking her virginity <laughs> which she considered a burden oh my god as an act of friendship in london in the early 1970s yeah that is cute he's the son of producer and writer dominic dunn and ellen beatrice griffin's father was of irish descent his maternal grandmother beatrice charlotte sandoval was born in nogales mexico to a mexican father alfredo sandoval and a mother from wyoming Clara Matilda Haller, who was of German and Swedish descent. Griffin's mother's other ancestry was Irish and English. He has a daughter named Hannah Dunn, born in January 1990, together with Carrie Lowell. He is the older brother of Dominique Dunn and Alexander Dunn. At age 18, Dunn skipped college and moved to New York to become an actor. Did it say where they were from originally? Wyoming? No, I thought he was born in New York, but then he... I thought he went to school in Massachusetts, and then he was in Colorado. He moved back to New York? Yeah, I guess so. All right, so yeah, so at age 18, he skipped college and moved back to New York to become an actor. He is good friends with Michael Keaton, as we know, uh, Batman and Beetlejuice. The producer, Denise Denovi, she worked on Beetlejuice, but I'm wondering if that's how he met Michael Keaton, like to be friends, because he like was like, oh, I liked her work in Beetlejuice. Possibly. Maybe. Quite possibly. Oh, uh, she did James and the Giant Peach. She did. She did do Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. So she's all up in the Tim Burton world. So she could have very oh, wow. well, she could have very well have met Griffin through <laughs> Beetlejuice. Or just introduced Michael Keaton to him. and then Right. Yeah. I mean, Hollywood's Hollywood. I compare Hollywood to high school. Everybody mm -hmm. knows everybody. Everybody's with work worked with somebody at mm. some point. Six degrees of of Kevin Bacon. Six degrees of Michael Keaton. And Billy Zane. <laughs> and Billy Zane, exactly. So Griffin founded the production company Double Play Productions with Amy Robinson. He studied drama at HB Studio in Greenwich Village in New York City. He studied acting under Uta Hagen. He's the nephew of John Gregory Dunn and Joan Didion. He frequently works with actress Rosanna Arquette, who also, Rosanna Arquette was also in a movie with Madonna, Desperately Seeking Susan. Oh, okay. Did you see that? Did you ever see that movie? A long time ago. I used to love that movie. I remember as a child, my mom would tape like TV movies onto VHS tapes. Like she would just like tape them from TV. Yeah. And for the longest time, I had this movie on a VHS tape. I would just like watch it all the time. She was such a, like my mom, such a Madonna fan in the 80s. So yeah, so Rosanna Arquette was also in the movie with Madonna and then Griffin Dunn was also in a different movie with Madonna. So there's a little bit of a connection there. Uh, he's cousin-in-laws with Jerry Michael. I don't know who that is. Do you know who that is? It's a, uh, you know who that is? Who is that? Griffin Dunn's cousin. In law. What, what did he do in Okay, so he was in he was a production coordinator in Private Obsession, a 1995. It doesn't say much about what this this might have been like a straight to VHS movie. <laughs> I don't know if this got much um publicity, but anyway, he's cousin in laws with that guy. And then also cousin of Quintana Ru Dunn. Quintana Ru Dunn was married to Jerry Michael, the guy we were just talking Got about. It. She actually passed away in 2005. Was she an actress also? I don't know much about her, but I know she died from complications from a flu that turned into pneumonia. Then she got septic shock. Oh, wow. Induced coma, brain bleed, five surgeries, and months in intensive care. Oh, my God. He is yeah. kind of surrounded by traumatic events. This woman, Quintana Ru Dunn, this is Joan Didion's daughter. Oh my goodness, that yeah. poor family. Yeah, so so a lot of heavy stuff surrounding him. And it's amazing how he's able to still have such like a 
charismatic, charming, light and airy, whimsical kind of personality for somebody mm -hmm. who has been surrounded by so much darkness mm -hmm. in Hollywood, you know? You have to be, I guess. Right. So here's some quotes from his IMDb page of stuff that he has said over the years. So he, he said, I've always been schizophrenic. I've never been interested in limiting myself. I came to New York to be an actor and I became a film producer first. I only got to be able to act because I gave myself a job as a producer. <laughs> Must be nice. Well, yeah, I mean, when you have all those family connections, I'm sure there were there was a lot more opportunity opening for sure. up for him. Um, I wonder if he's saying like schizophrenic in like a tongue in cheek kind of way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he also says, you're more open minded when you know you're not listening to ideas with the gun to your head. I guess that he's talking about maybe the freedoms of working as an actor or as as a director. Without... He might have had a lot more uh, leeway with like his decisions too than a lot of other producers have when they're first starting out. Right. And also going back to what he was saying about how he got put in director's jail from the studio because the box office numbers weren't what they wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. But regardless of that, he still seems like the type of director that is not going to limit themselves to what the studio wants just for the sake of the numbers. Like he really wants to churn out a good piece of art, you know? Yeah. So he's, That's yeah, cool. he's an artist first and foremost. So acting is what I originally wanted to do, he says. Unfortunately, the business of being an actor is a lot more disheartening than the business of being a producer. As an actor, you're beholden to the material and taste of other people who are developing projects you may or may not get in. As a producer, you come up with the ideas. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, man. Like, you are the change. What's the saying? You are the change you want to see in others right. or some shit like that. Or you make your own luck, right? You make your own opportunities. Curses only have power if you believe in them. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like our situation. Like, we were looking for a practical magic podcast that we wanted to listen to. Couldn't find one. Well, then I guess it's our job to create one. I, I guess know. I'll just fucking do it. That I also guess, yeah. is like the mindset of almost every woman. It's like, well, I'll just fucking do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But like if you if if you're trying to find something that you're ultimately not finding, then that's a sign, I think, from the universe that you're the one that's supposed to create it. Take up that mantle. Mm -hmm. Take up that exactly. I still can't believe we're doing this. Take up the challenge. All right. So what was this thing on this digital collections article? What's that from? Um, you linked this, it's just a photo. I didn't know what you wanted. Oh, to do. I thought this was cute. Did you look at this? It's a it's a photo of Sandra Bullock and Griffin Dunn during the production of Practical Magic. Yeah. And it's, it's cute. in her apothecary shop. And some of the behind the scenes shots, you can see they're like in coats a lot. Like the scene where they run out and J Jillian's like, he's trying to get to us by making them grow. And, and one of the, like his practice takes, they're in like really heavy down jackets. It must have been cold. And they're out there, like Sandy's out there in like a little spaghetti strap. Right. In the actual scene, she must have been freezing. Yeah, I'm wondering, did it say what months they were filming this in? I know it was the Pacific Northwest. I no clue. But, I mean, it must have been cold. Everything that's not dressed is green. So mm -hmm. it has to be between fucking May and September? Maybe. How oh. long does this thing take to shoot? How long do you think they were shooting for? I don't know. They must have had to do all this the exterior stuff while they could, while everything was green right. and all the other stuff they could do in the studio. But also, remember, that whole garden was fake. I know, but all the trees, like, like the far away shots, like the outside, like where the driveway is and all that stuff. Yeah. And like the grass is green. Right. I don't know. We got to ask them. More of a rabbit hole. We got to go down. I'm looking at this link repository, Margaret Herrick Library. I'm wondering what that is. I'm wondering if we could find more pictures. It's a digital collections website. Let's see. If we search practical magic, I'm wondering if anything else would pop up. Nope, that's the only that's the only uh, thing. That was <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Go. Dead end. We'll <laughs> X on out of that. We don't have to spend too much time on that. I just thought it was a cute photo of them during the production that I've never seen that photo before. Link that below. I don't um, think there are a lot of photos of him in the production, right. apart from the behind the scenes like clips. And right. That. Yeah. All right. So I think it's time for a break. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good. What are we gonna do when we come back? All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about his sister, Dominique, and his aunt Joan, Joan Didion. We're gonna talk about some of his Grandma Joan. He's a grandma Joan or Aunt Joan. He has some notable family members who have forged their own paths in Hollywood. Unfortunately are no longer with us, but we're gonna tell you a little bit about them when we come back. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hey little witches. And now we want to share the magic of Grounded by the Moon with you, our listeners. Joseph Benitez Egerton, the creator behind Grounded by the Moon, would like to offer this very special 10% off discount to all who wish to experience the magic of his practical magic themed tarot and oracle decks. 
And let's not forget about his custom handcrafted all natural soy candles, where every candle is hand poured and personally infused and charged under the light of the moon. They even come with a generous crystal. All of Joseph's offerings are just so magical. So go visit groundedbythemoon.com and use the coupon code Magnolia Magic for 10% off your entire order at checkout. You're listening to the Magnolia Street Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to do a card pull for our Griffin Dunn episode. I'm really interested to know what comes up because like, I don't, I, I would not even know where to begin. Right. Yeah. Maybe like, like taking the lead direction, knowing your instincts. I don't know. I don't even know what would come up. All right. Tell me when to stop. Stop. Bone tree day. Bone tree day. Community is the keyword on the card. Community. Okay. Also, the term reach out. It is time to reach out to those around you. Learn to lean on those who are near and dear to you in times of need. Loved friends and family are the best and strongest support that you have. Use these connections to help you with any issues or questions that you may have. They are here to support you. The tree is a symbol of great wisdom and having a strong foundation. The more branches a tree has, the stronger the roots. As the great tree grows and extends its branches, it in turn depends its stable connection to the earth. Become the tree. You can also utilize the magic of this card, its affirmation, and a green candle for its connection to the stable and grounding element of earth. And the mantra is, my branches are as strong as my roots. I Love that. It's perfect for this because he has to delegate. We just talked about how much he has to lean on other people mm-hmm. you know, and trust them with the editing process, with carry the movie. Like a director has to lean on so many people. Yeah. And it also says love, loved friends and family are the best and strongest support that you have. He comes from a very extensive uh, family of Hollywood. Good it's, point. His roots are deep in Hollywood, mm-hmm. which is a great segue because we're actually going to talk about some of those people now right yeah absolutely we can't talk about griffin unfortunately without touching on some tragedies that surrounded him and we talked a little bit about this and i think our goofs and trivia about his late sister dominique dunn and what happened with her demise so we want to talk about dominique and she was born dominique ellen dunn november 23rd 1959 and she passed away well she was murdered Sadly, on November 4th, 1982, she was an American actress born and raised in Santa Monica, California, and she studied acting at the Milton Katselis Workshop, where she appeared in stage productions. She made her on-screen debut in the television film Diary of a Teenage Hitchhiker, and thereafter played the reoccurring role of Erica on the drama series family in 1980 and paulina borstein on the comedy series breaking away which was 1980 to 1981 her breakthrough came with the starring role of dana freeling in the horror film poltergeist in 1982 establishing her as a horror icon she went on to headline the western film the shadow riders in 82 and portrayed amy kent on the crime series chips in 82 Before her murder, Dunn was cast in the miniseries V, the letter V, in 83. However, she died midway through filming and was replaced by Blair Hefkin. Sadly, on October 30th, 82, Dominique was strangled by her ex-boyfriend, John Thomas Sweeney, during an argument on the driveway of her West Hollywood home. She fell into a coma and died five days later on November 4th, 1982. In a court case which gained significant media coverage, Sweeney was convicted of voluntary manslaughter in Dunn's death and served three and a half years in prison. He served only three and a half years for Mm -hmm. voluntary manslaughter. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Yeah. So touching back on Poltergeist in 1981, she gained that significant attention when she was cast as Dana Freeling in the supernatural horror film Poltergeist. The movie, produced by Steven Spielberg and directed by Toby Hooper, marked her feature film debut. Poltergeist was a critical and commercial success, becoming one of the highest grossing films in 1982 and gaining a cult following over the years. Dominique was set to reprise her role in the sequels, but passed away before production began on the second film, Poltergeist 2, The Other Side, which explained her character's absence by stating that she had gone off to attend college. It's so sad. Yeah. 
That's fucked up. Hey, my favorite word, posthumous release of unfinished projects. Posthumous. This is not humorous at all. No. Dominique appeared posthumously in the Hill Street Blues episode Requiem for a Hair Bag, which aired on November 18th, 1982, only two weeks after her death. In the episode, she played a teenage mother who was a victim of parental abuse who chose to give her baby up for adoption out of fear of repeating the cycle of abuse that she endured with her parents. Due to an altercation with John Sweeney, her abusive partner, her abuses on screen were natural. Wow. Nobody said anything like, oh, we don't have to do makeup on you. You're fine. Like, nobody like, hey, this works for us. Yeah, nobody questioned. So toxic. Like, Hollywood is so fucking toxic. (sighs) That's very sad. (sighs) The episode aired on November 18th, 1982, 12 days after her funeral, and it was dedicated to her memory. Dunn was cast in the miniseries. It's V. I'm wondering if it means five. You might be right. She died during filming, so her role, as we talked about, was portrayed by the actress Blair Tefkin. And according to the series creator Kenneth Johnson, they recovered footage of Dominique, and that was used as a cameo appearance. The series was released in 1983, and it was dedicated to her memory. Yeah, this all happened before my time. I was born in 83, so... I don't remember any of this. I didn't even not even know this until you told me a couple months ago. Right. I know that the movie Poltergeist, or so I've heard throughout, you know, my many years of being a huge horror movie buff, I've heard the stories over the years. Mm-hmm. Poltergeist apparently was cursed, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but not Ooh. before we talk a little bit about her relationship with this John Sweeney character, her abusive partner who ultimately ended her life. So this John Thomas Sweeney guy, he was a sous chef. Dunn met John Thomas Sweeney at a restaurant, the one that he worked at, Ma Maison, at a party in 1981. After a few weeks of dating, they moved into a one-bedroom house together on Wrangley Avenue in West Hollywood. And due to his jealousy and possessiveness, their relationship quickly deteriorated. Their fights escalated and Sweeney began physically abusing Dunn. In one incident, he violently pulled out chunks of her hair during an argument. Terrified, Dunn sought refuge at her mother's house, but Sweeney showed up, demanding entry and causing a disturbance. Dunn's mother intervened and threatened to call the police, forcing Sweeney to leave. Despite this, Dunn later returned to their shared home and they resumed their relationship. The violence continued and on September 26, 1982, Sweeney choked and strangled Dunn during an argument. A friend who was present at the time heard the distressing sounds and intervened, saving Dunn. So this was before the incident that ultimately ended her life. So he's choked her before and luckily the friend the first time intervened and, you know, stopped Mm -hmm. it from happening. So she confided in her friend that Sweeney had tried to kill her, but he denied it and asked her to come back to bed. Dunn deceived him by pretending to comply, but instead escaped through the bathroom window. As she started her car, Sweeney jumped onto the hood, forcing her to Is stop moment. right? Hang on. This seems a little crazy. Because I remember I was like, I'm going to get this shortened. And I put it in the thing. I was like, just shorten this. I'm what? Did they take fucking liberties with this? I don't want it Wait, to. Wait, was this AI? Yeah, remember I was like, I'm going to take this massive paragraph and have them just write a summary of it. I'm hoping it didn't. I'm like, going add... to read this right from the wiki page. Yeah, I know. I was just trying to shorten it because it's so fucking long. But yeah, that's probably a better idea. All right. So after he tries to kill her and the friend intervenes, she denies the claim. He asks her to come back to bed. She pretended that she was going to comply with his request, but she snuck out of the bathroom window. When Sweeney heard Dunn start the engine of her car, he ran out and jumped onto the hood of the car. This really happened. Oh my God. Okay. All right. Like to me, that sounded so crazy that i thought this guy was up on the notes this guy was crazy he was nuts he fucking killed her he wouldn't stop at anything to keep her under his control she stopped the car long enough for sweeney to jump off the hood and then she drove away for the next few days she stayed with her mother and she also stayed at the home of her friends she later called sweeney and ended the relationship after he moved out she had the locks changed and moved back into the wrangley avenue home got it okay so now we're Moving on to the night of her death. I want to touch on the fact that like Griffin like signed on to Practical Magic with the knowledge of this kind of abuse in the movie, you know, the domestic abuse that was in the movie when this had just happened only a handful of years prior. Right. It's really sad. Like he is a strong man. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's been in interviews since talking about the death penalty and he's actually against the death penalty. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he said, I have every reason to be for it, but I still think it's inhumane. He doesn't believe in the death penalty at all. Wow. His mother actually founded that foundation to help homicide victims. Mm-hmm. So there's just a lot to unpack here. So let's talk about the night of her death. She died on October 30th, 
the night before Halloween. I don't want to make jokes, but talk about being on brand for like, she wasn't in the poltergeist, a big box office horror film at that time. I feel like he was trying, like he was not trying to be funny, but right. like, try like he was trying a little too hard to like make it a thing more so than it already was. You're talking about her, her attacker, her like choosing other the 30th, basically. Yeah, it's almost yeah, exactly. It's a little sick, right? A little, mm -hmm. little fucking twisted. So on October 30th, 1982, a few weeks after Sweeney and Dunn broke up, she was at her West Hollywood home rehearsing for the miniseries. V with actor David Packer. While she was speaking to a female friend on the phone, Sweeney had the operator break into the conversation. Dunn told her friend, oh god, it's Sweeney, let me get him off the phone. Ten minutes later, however, Sweeney showed up at Dunn's house. After speaking to him through the locked door, Dunn agreed to speak to him on the porch while Packer remained inside. Outside, the two began to argue. Later, Packer said that he heard smacking sounds, two screams, and a thud. Concerned, he called the police, but he was informed that Dunn's home was out of their jurisdiction. What the fuck? Yeah, like, what? That makes no sense. Like, why did the number go to that police department if it's out of the jurisdiction, you know? Mm -hmm. Packer then phoned a friend and told him that if he was found dead, John Sweeney was his killer. Packer left the home through the back entrance, approached the driveway, and saw Sweeney in some nearby bushes kneeling over Dunn. Sweeney told Packer to call the police. When the police arrived, Sweeney met them in the driveway with his hands in the air and stated, I killed my girlfriend and I tried to kill myself. Sweeney later testified that he and Dunn had argued, but he could not remember what happened after their exchange. He claimed that he could only recall being on top of her with his hands around her neck. Dunn was transported to the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles where she was placed on life support. She never regained consciousness. Over the following days, doctors performed brain scans, which revealed that due to oxygen deprivation, she had no brain activity. On November 4th, her parents consented to have her removed from life support. At the request of her mother, Dunn's kidneys and heart were donated to transplant recipients. Her funeral was held on November 6th at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills. Her godfather, Martin Manulis, delivered the eulogy. She was buried in Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery. On the night of Dunn's attack, responding officers found Sweeney standing by Dunn's unconscious body in her driveway. A spokesman for the West Hollywood Sheriff later told reporters that Sweeney told officers, I killed my girlfriend. He was immediately arrested and charged with attempted murder. Attempted? Like, he murdered her? Yeah, straight up. Straight up. Maybe because uh, she had been taken to the hospital and was on life support, it wasn't. So because she wasn't dead on the scene or dead on arrival, it was... Right. Those charges were dropped after Dunn's death, however, and subsequently, Sweeney was charged with first-degree murder, to which he pleaded not guilty. Sweeney was later charged with assault with intent to do great bodily harm when, during a preliminary trial hearing, he admitted that he and Dunn had a physical altercation on September 26, 1982, the day before she filmed the Hill Street Blues episode, in which she appeared with visible bruises on her face and body. He denied assaulting Dunn, however, claiming that she accidentally incurred the bruises when he tried to prevent her from leaving her home. Fuck this, this fuck. piece of trash. Yeah. You're a trash person. This was a very long trial because he was on trial after he, I guess, he was taken into custody. So Sweeney's trial began in August 1983 and was presided over by Judge Burton S. Katz. During the trial, Sweeney took the stand in his own defense. He testified that he had not intended to harm Dunn the night he arrived at her home. He claimed that they had reconciled, that they were planning to move back in together, and that the two had daily discussions about getting married and having children. On the night of October 30th, Sweeney said that Dunn had abruptly changed her mind about a reconciliation. However, telling him that she had been leading him on and lying to him about getting back together. At that point, Sweeney said that he, quote, exploded and lunged toward her, end quote. Sweeney claimed to have no recollection of attacking Dunn until he discovered that he was on top of her with his hands around her neck. He then realized that she was not breathing. Sweeney said that he attempted to revive her by making her oh, walk, walk around, yeah, but she fell down. He then attempted to give her CPR, which caused Dunn to vomit. Sweeney said that he also vomited, ran into Dunn's house, and consumed two bottles of pills in an attempt to kill himself. He then returned to the driveway where he laid down beside Dunn, waiting for the pills to take effect. Sweeney's court-appointed attorney, Michael Adelson, argued that his client's actions were neither premeditated nor were they executed with malice. What? what? You're, are you- What? Fuck you, Michael. In what world is strangling your girlfriend to death not malice? What the fuck? 
Oh, uh, she, uh, fuck this guy. Yeah. So instead, he maintained that Sweeney, provoked by Dunn's alleged deception, acted in the heat of passion. Okay, so now we're going to blame the victim for, quote, deceiving. Okay. Unbelievable. 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 Yeah. Dunn's family disputed Sweeney's claim that she had reconciled with him. However, they insisted that he went to Dunn's home on October 30th in an effort to persuade her to reconcile after she told him that their breakup was permanent. The prosecution and police investigators also dismissed Sweeney's version of events because there was no physical evidence that he had consumed pills in an attempt to commit suicide at the time. He's a fucking liar! Exactly. Upon their arrival, the police said that they found Sweeney's demeanor to be both calm and collected. Yeah, because he's a sociopath. Yeah. Deputy Frank D'Amelio, the first officer to arrive on the scene, testified that Sweeney told him, Man, I blew it. I killed her. I didn't think I choked her that hard, but I don't know. I just kept on choking her. I just lost my temper and blew it again. Regardless, again? regardless again. of whether or not, like, you didn't mean to choke her that hard, you choked her, period. Like, that's all that they need to know, that you were a psychopathic, abusive- you Assaulted a woman. Exactly. <sighs> the medical ex- This makes me so mad. I know, I'm, I'm furious. The medical examiner who performed Dunn's autopsy determined that the victim had been strangled for at least three minutes. That's a long fucking time. Mm-hmm. Given the results of the autopsy, the police and prosecutors dismissed the defense's argument that Sweeney acted unconsciously. However, because they concluded that in the three minutes in which Sweeney strangled the victim, he had ample opportunities to regain control of his actions, which might have saved Dunn's life. You know when you're in the middle like of a crisis and everything seems to happen so fucking fast? Yeah. Can you imagine standing there for three minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I I totally get what this is saying. Like, you had 60 seconds times three. (laughs) 120 (laughs) to figure it out. Yeah. So to establish a history of Sweeney's violent behavior, the prosecution called one of Sweeney's ex-girlfriends, Lillian Pierce, and asked her to testify. Pierce, who at the request of Sweeney's attorney did not testify in the jury's presence, stated that she and Sweeney had dated on and off from 1977 to 1980. Pierce claimed that during their relationship, Sweeney had assaulted her on 10 separate occasions, and as a result, she was hospitalized twice for the injuries, which she sustained. During one of the assaults, Pierce sustained a perforated eardrum and a collapsed lung. She later sustained a broken nose. Uh, during Wait. This was his ex-girlfriend. Oh, his ex-girlfriend. Oh, who wow. Yeah. So Pierce. Okay. He had a history of beating probably every woman he's ever been with. He is a real-life Jimmy Angelo. A real life piece of shit, yeah. So during Pierce's testimony, Sweeney became enraged, jumped up from his seat, and ran towards the door leading to the judge's chambers. He was subdued by two bailiffs and four armed guards. Sweeney was then handcuffed to his chair, and he began to cry. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. He apologized to the court for the outburst which Judge Katz accepted. Attorney Michael Adelson requested that Judge Katz rule Pierce's testimony inadmissible because it was, quote, prejudicial. No, factual. Yeah. Factual. Yeah. He factually ruptured her ear. Uh Uh-huh. Judge Katz granted the request, and the jury only learned about Pierce's testimony after the trial. That's what, why was that withheld from them? Why was, why was her testimony withheld from the jury? So they couldn't make an informed decision? I cannot begin to understand the ins and outs of our judicial system. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. (sighs) So Katz also refused to allow testimony from Dunn's mother, Ellen Dunn, as well as Dunn's friends, citing their statements about Sweeney's abusive nature as hearsay. I feel like his mother may very well have been a victim of his too. Like, can you, like if he's treating everybody else like that, of course- Physically or more psychologically on her end? Oh, I don't doubt he might've grabbed her by the arms. He might've pushed her around. Like this guy's a piece of shit. Right, that's fucked up. He wouldn't even allow testimony from her mother, Ellen. So mm. anything she said, any kind of testimony that she gave any kind of lawyers was dismissed. Like they couldn't even use her firsthand okay. accounts. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is talking about Dominique's mother. I'm thinking about his mother. I was thinking that they wouldn't allow his mother. And I'm like, I can only imagine trying to be this shitbag's mom mm. and like the upbringing that you had to like endure come like this. I don't know. I don't know. You're, you're saying you think his mother was abusive toward him. Maybe that's why he became that way, which is no excuse to treat somebody. No, no, no. Like that, yeah, but- I was confused at, at the, the sentence. Right. I thought it was talking about his mother was not allowed to give testimony and like thinking about him growing up and being as awful as he is that he would then he would have been abusive to her is what I was thinking just of the way he is. Yeah, no, this was Ellen Dunn. 
yeah. Dominique's mother, they would not let her testify. So anything that she said, any firsthand accounts that she had of witnessing all mm -hmm. of this abuse, that was all dismissed as hearsay because it was not said in the courtroom. It was wow. not brought into, yeah, really fucked up. On August 29th, defense attorney Michael Adelson also requested that Judge Katz rule that the court lacks sufficient evidence to try Sweeney on the charge of first-degree murder because predetermination was not established. Judge Katz granted the request, and as such, the jurors were instructed to consider the charges of manslaughter or second-degree murder. Deputy District Attorney Stephen Barship later said that this decision, along with Judge Katz's previous rulings, barring the testimonies of both Sweeney's ex-girlfriend and Dunn's mother and friends, seriously undermined the prosecution's case against Sweeney. 100%. If you're, if you see all of this, like, abuse go down firsthand and you're not allowed to give your testimony, mm -hmm. uh, there's an inside yeah. job going on. Somebody on the inside was vouching for this dick bag. Like, I somebody was really protecting. I don't know how it works, but there have been other cases where you're like, why wasn't that taken into consideration? Yeah. Like, this is not the first and only time. It's just so, it, I'm like, take a deep breath. Yeah. It, all it's, right. It's very, it enrages me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't even want to keep going, but we have to because he was sentenced. So, so yeah. So now we're going to talk about the verdict and the sentencing. On September 21st, 1983, after eight days of deliberation, the jury acquitted John Sweeney of second degree murder, but found him guilty of lesser charges of voluntary manslaughter. He was also convicted of misdemeanor assault for the altercation with Dunn that occurred on September 26th, 1982. Dominique's family was outraged by the verdict, calling it an injustice, of course. Mm -hmm. After Judge Katz excused the jury and commented on the judicial system being upheld, upheld, oh. Dominic Dunn, the victim's father, yelled, not for our family, Judge Katz, before he left the courtroom. Dominic Dunn accused Judge Katz of purposely withholding Sweeney's ex-girlfriend's testimony from the jury, which would have established his violent history with women. Mm -hmm. Victims for Victims, a victim's rights group, which was founded by actress Teresa Saldana, protested against the verdict by staging a march outside the courthouse. Afterwards, several media outlets also debated the events of the trial and the verdict. Several outlets criticized Judge Katz's ruling, which many argued was preferential towards the defense. Right? That's what it seems like. Yeah. So many unanswered questions yeah one local los angeles tv station polled viewers who rated judge katz the fourth worst judge in los angeles county that's a shame on november 10th sweeney was sentenced to six years in prison for manslaughter which was the maximum sentence which he could have received with an additional six months for assault charges as sweeney's sentencing judge katz criticized the jury's verdict of manslaughter stating that he felt that dunn's death was quote a cause pure and simple of murder murder with malice okay so then what the hell okay Okay, so yeah, really. Why that the ruling? The jury's foreman, Paul Spiegel, later told the media that both he and his fellow jurors were surprised by Judge Katz's criticism, and he called his comment, quote, a cheap shot. Spiegel felt that Judge Katz's criticism did not stem from their verdict, but from the harsh criticism he received afterward. Spiegel went on to say that had the jury been provided with the opportunity to hear all the evidence, it would have convicted Sweeney of murder. 100%. So he's like, jury, what the fuck? This is murder, plain and simple and they're like yeah we know but you won't take this evidence so we have to label it what we're labeling it right ass hat <laughs> christina was over there ah! all right take us to the aftermath all right so on the advice of tina brown dominic dunn kept who is tina brown let's see um a journal english journalist Okay. Dominic Dunn kept a journal throughout the trial. His journal writings were later published in an article titled Justice, a Father's Account of the Trial of His Daughter's Killer, which was featured in the March 1984 issue of Vanity Fair. Shortly after the trial, Judge Burton S. Katz, who presided over the case, transferred to the juvenile court in Silmar, Los Angeles. He later admitted that some of his controversial rulings in Dunn's case pained him, but he reiterated his thought that Sweeney should have been convicted of murder and given a lengthier sentence. That's so, that's so fucked. A year after her daughter's death, Dominique's mother, Ellen Lenny Dunn, founded Justice for Homicide Victims, a victim's rights advocacy group. After the trial, John Sweeney was incarcerated in a medium security prison in Susanville, California. He was released on parole in September 1986 after serving only three years, seven months, and 27 days of his six and a half year sentence. After his release, Sweeney was hired as a head chef at an upscale restaurant in Santa Monica, California. After he discovered where Sweeney was working, Dunn's brother Griffin and her mother Lenny stood outside the restaurant where they handed flyers out to patrons. The flyers read, the food 
food you will eat tonight was cooked by the hands that killed Dominique Dunn. Holy fucking what shit. What the fuck? Whoa. Christine All right. like bouncing out of her chair in fury. Holy, sh holy shit. I, no words. Sweeney eventually quit his job due to the protests which were staged by Dunn's family and he moved out of Los Angeles. Like, dude, you're, you just fucked with some pretty high up people in Hollywood and not like not that people in positions of power should use that to their advantage or use those powers for evil, but you just fucked with a family, a well-known family in Hollywood. You think your ass isn't going to be run out of town? Like, you really, you really got out of jail serving less of a sentence than you were supposed to, and you just get a job and expect to, like, act like life is completely normal? back into society. Yeah, no, fuck that. No, fuck that guy. That's crazy. So he was literally run out of town. Literally run out of town. So he quit his job. He leaves Los Angeles. In the mid-1990s, Dominic Dunn was contacted by a Florida physician who came across an article which Dunn wrote about Dominic's death. The doctor informed Dunn that his daughter had recently become engaged to a chef who went by the name of John Sweeney and inquired if that man was the same man who was responsible for Dominique's death. The man was later identified as the same John Sweeney and in an effort to protect the young woman who was now engaged to John Sweeney, <gasps> Dunn's brother Griffin contacted the woman and asked her to reconsider her oh. decision. Griffin. That is unfortunate. Now he's back into society and probably doing the same shit. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, Sweeney accused the Duns of harassing him, and in an effort to avoid further altercations, he changed his name. So he is out here still. Y'all, <laughs> like this, also, the scary thing, he's not the only one. He is right. not the only man who's doing this. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, right. He changed okay. his fucking name to avoid, the, I guess, them finding him again and coming in between any relationship he tries to have from that point forward. Good. Oh, poor baby. You can't have a girlfriend. Yeah. Fucking stop killing him. Yeah. In later interviews in which Dominic Dunn discussed his daughter's murder, the writer shared that for a time he employed the services of private investigator Anthony Pelicano and asked him to follow Sweeney and report on his actions and whereabouts. According to Dunn's father, Pelicano reported that Sweeney had moved to the Pacific Northwest, assumed the name John Mora, and continued to work as a chef. Later, Dunn's father said that he decided that he no longer wished to squander his life by following Sweeney, and as a result of his decision, he discontinued all of his attempts to maintain his knowledge of Sweeney's whereabouts. Mm. So the case goes cold at that point. <laughs> you can only work for so long to keep right. other people safe. Yeah. And that has to be so exhausting exhausting never mind trying to work through your own grief and own personal connections to this person who you know should not be out there and right. like I, I totally understand like you can't fault him for being like i can't do any more than i've already done right yeah i just feel for any of the other women who are involved with this fuck like definitely okay so girls like if you date a man and his ex comes out of the word work and is like listen he has tendencies to do xyz mm -hmm. even if you for some reason think she's like oh she's jealous da, da, da. she's saying this for a reason like she has been through even if even if she is jealous i think i would be like okay bye bye guy like i'm not even gonna fuck with this go ahead i i no, i was just gonna say as a young and stupid person not that i was ever in that kind of abusive relationship but i remember in high school i was dating this guy and this girl who dated him before me came up to me she confronted me and she was like listen this is the deal about this guy oh I yeah i don't know if you wanted i don't know if you want to date him and you know you know when you're young and dumb you just you, you do just, it anyway you see what you want to see you don't you don't really pay it any mind you're like oh those are just rumors i'm not gonna believe that like no she was exactly right and it was my own fucking fault because i didn't listen to her you're not dead so no 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 yeah it, it wasn't like she wasn't like oh he was abusive or anything like right, that. right but like she that. was spitting the truth but she was spitting the truth she's like you know he's he talks to other girls and you know like you know she was giving giving it to me straight but i wanted i didn't want to hear any of it because mm -hmm. i'm young and in love and you're not going to listen to people you're going to do what you want to do ultimately yeah. And unfortunately, you know, we, we learn the hard way. Yeah. Careful just, out there, ladies. I just feel for these other women who are still dealing with his shit, mm -hmm. even yeah. still today, maybe. Like, I don't know. I don't, we don't know where he is, what he's up to. We don't know who he's no. dating. But I just hope anybody who comes across his path is okay um, and doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't get to this point. This is 
crazy. Yeah. She so, looks like him too. She's so she cute. Knows. She's so beautiful, so talented. And, you yeah. know, just in her memory, we, we hold her here on Magnolia Street. She can stay here with us. Yeah. You know? The Grim Life Collective, which I've talked about a lot, they visit a lot of movie scene locations, but they also visit a lot of grave sites of celebrities who have passed on. And they actually did a whole video special on Dominique Dunn, and um, they tell her story about her tragic death. They also visit her grave site and some poltergeist filming locations. So we will link that video in the show notes down below if you want a more visual account of her story and where you can go pay your respects to her if you're in Hollywood. So they come Cover all that on their YouTube channel. One other thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the poltergeist curse. I love a curse. I know. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good curse? Practical magic uh, starts with a curse. Exactly. So the poltergeist curse, this is a rumored curse attached to the trilogy and its crew. And this comes from the deaths of the two young cast members in the six years between the releases of the first and the third films. The rumor and the surrounding deaths were explored in 2002 on an episode of E! True Hollywood Story titled The Curse of Poltergeist. The first cast member to pass was Dominique. She played the eldest daughter, Dana, in the first film, died on November 4th, 1982 at the age of 22, as we just talked about her murder. And then the second cast member to pass away of this film was Heather O'Rourke, who actually played Carol Ann, the little blonde girl in the poltergeist films she died on february 1st 1988 at the age of 12 due to complications from an acute bowel obstruction so very unfortunate so the curse of poltergeist um this is actually a documentary film based on the mystery of the franchise this was set to begin shooting in november 2015 with adam rip as director financing the production production was to be provided by his company vega baby alongside indonesia based md pictures the documentary intended to focus on the life and experience of actor oliver robbins who played robbie freeling in the first and second installments of the franchise as a way to explore the tragedies that have befallen those involved with the film the movie has yet to be produced so i don't think this documentary documentary ever came to fruition mm -hmm. but check out that e true hollywood story view if you could find that anywhere on the internet didn't uh, um the exorcist also have like a weird thing attached to it like a weird curse attached to it i don't know maybe I love a spooky curse i know yeah it basically stemmed from the depths of those two cast members okay and people keep dying <laughs> yeah uh, tragically you know it's yeah. day, but th these are like, uncharacteristically weird very strange. For a 12-year-old? Very strange. Have a bowel obstruction? So strange. Yeah, that is a strange... I've never even heard of that kind of death in a child. Mm-hmm. You know? Very sad. Oh, it is sad. We know that was a lot about Dominique, but we... And this is a Griffin Dunn episode, but she had a huge part in Hollywood as well. And yeah. the family connection is there. And we wanted to honor her by telling her story telling her story not many people might, well might not know about dominique mm -hmm. and her talent so yeah. um we wanted to share that a little bit we're also going to talk a little bit now about griffin dunn's beloved aunt joan didion aunt joan <laughs> This was written in December of 2021, so pretty recently, and this is from People.com, and Griffin is paying tribute to his beloved Aunt Joan and her extraordinary life and literary contributions. Joan was a renowned writer who passed away at the age of 87. Griffin bid farewell to his Aunt Joan for the last time, while her vast readership also began their goodbyes to one of the greatest writers of our time. He witnessed Joan's character, self-respect, and toughness firsthand, drawing inspiration from her insightful words about exhibiting moral nerve and character. That reminds me a lot of Aunt Franny, A. And B, this must be one of the women before when he was like, I've always been surrounded by strong women in my life mm -hmm. that he was mentioning. Griffin's connection to his aunt deepened as he produced and directed the documentary film, Joan Diddy in the Center Will Not Hold. The intimate portrayal released on, oh, it's on Netflix in 2017, and it delves into Joan's life and work through archival footage and personal conversations between Griffin and his beloved aunt. How special to have that. Right. Like that you did that, you know, oh, I love that. Yeah. Joan Didion was born in California in 1934 and began her career at Vogue after studying at the University of California, Berkeley. Her debut novel, Run River, marked the start of a remarkable writing journey spanning several decades. 
Throughout her life, Joan faced personal tragedies, including the loss of her husband, John Gregory Dunn, and their daughter, Quintana Roo. She bravely documented these experiences in her renowned works such as The Year of Magical Thinking. I've heard of that book. Yeah, same. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Which received critical acclaim and was adapted into a Broadway stage production. Joan Didion's legacy includes influential books like Slouching Towards Bethlehem and The White Album. Her final published work, Let Me Tell You What I Mean, is a compilation of essays written from 1968 to 2000. Wow. Amazing her unmatched talent and insight. It says, join us now as we remember the profound impact of Joan Didion's writing and the enduring bond between Griffin Dunn and his remarkable aunt. Yeah. Really sweet. You can read the whole, I think it's an interview style, but it's at people.com and it, it will be linked. So he just talks about his relationship with her? Yeah. So she, yeah, she did a lot of political writing. It says on her wiki page, she concentrated on the subtext of political and social rhetoric. Oh. And she also, like you said, she did the stuff for Vogue. She worked for Vogue from 1956 to 1964. She worked her way up from promotional copywriter to associate feature editor. The Year of Magical Thinking, it's a narrative of her response to the death of her husband and the severe illness of their daughter. She finished the manuscript 88 days later on New Year's Eve. Written at the age of 70, this was her first non-fiction book that was a collection of magazine assignments. She said that she found the subsequent book tour process very therapeutic during her period of mourning documenting the grief that she experienced after the sudden death of her husband the book was called a quote masterpiece of two genres memoir and investigative journalism and won several awards visiting los angeles after her father's funeral quintana fell at the airport hit her head on the pavement and required brain surgery for hematoma oh, wow. after progressing toward recovery in 2004 quintana died of acute pancreatitis on august 26 2005 um age 39 during didion's new york promotion for the year of magical thinking didion wrote about quintana's death in the 2011 book blue nights joan didion passed away from complications due to parkinson's disease at her manhattan home on december 23rd 2021 at the age of 87 so yeah she had a long long career mm -hmm. again i just think it's really special guys talk to your elders yeah talk to the people who have the stories they had a huge long life before you came along right like you did that for your grandfather you guys made a whole book I know that it it's it's very special. Yeah, it's a very special time. Beautiful. So next we have a bit about um, his father. He talks about his father in this NPR interview that Justine is going to tell us about. So you can, you can find this on NPR.org, but we will link this in our show notes. In a recent interview for Fresh Air, Griffin Dunn, actor, director, and producer, spoke about his late father, Dominic Dunn, a renowned writer known for his novels on the lives of the rich and famous, as well as his coverage of high-profile murder trials for Vanity Fair. Griffin shared that he had been a reader of his father's novels since the first one and even offered advice that turned out to be mistaken. He also discussed his father's posthumously published final novel, Too Much Money. One notable aspect of the novel that caught media attention was the character's admission of being closeted and celibate for nearly two decades. Griffin revealed that while this revelation wasn't surprising to him, it had never been explicitly discussed within the family. He described their conversations about his father's sexuality as, quote, closeted in nature, and he found it touching that his father had openly referenced it in the novel. Griffin also expressed that there was no reason for his father to be nervous about revealing this aspect to his middle-aged children. It was something that they were aware of, but had never extensively discussed. Griffin Dunn emphasized that he did not feel a significant loss regarding this aspect of his father's life, as it had always been left up to him to share or not. The siblings had conversations amongst themselves, but it was never a subject brought up with their father directly. During the interview, Griffin Dunn shared his observations about his father's close friendship with a man named Norman. He mentioned that after his sister's tragic death, Norman's friendship with his father transitioned from being his sister's best friend to his father's closest confidant. Years later, when his father was terminally ill and seeking treatment in a stem cell clinic in Germany, it was Norman who his father trusted to accompany him. Griffin described witnessing the deep history and affection between the two men during this time in Germany, considering it as a chance to connect with the stepbrother he had never met before. When asked if he believed Norman and his father had been lovers, Griffin responded affirmatively, stating that they had indeed been in a romantic relationship. Griffin Dunn also discussed his father's early fascination with celebrity, crime, and notoriety. He revealed that his father used to attend funerals of mobsters and movie stars even before he became famous himself. Living near Campbell Brothers Funeral Home in New York, 
a popular location for high-profile funerals, allowed his father to indulge in his interest. In those days, there were no guest lists or restrictions, so anyone could attend the viewings. Griffin recounted how his father and his friend Mark Crawley would casually enter the main viewing room, joining the line to catch a glimpse of famous individuals like Valentino and Clifton Webb. Attending these funerals became part of his father's exploration and development of his voice as a writer, drawing inspiration from the voyeuristic nature of such events and finding his unique perspective. Griffin Dunn discussed his understanding of his father's fascination with celebrity and the importance it held for him. He believed that his father's interest in celebrity was rooted in his own experience as an outcast within his family. Dominic Dunn, being the one who devoured fan magazines and dreamt of glamorous life beyond his reach, found solace in movies, parties, and the world of celebrities. Griffin saw his father's pursuit of fame and obsession with celebrities as a reflection of his longing for a different life, one filled with security and glamour that his family couldn't provide. It's so sad. But now, like, it's beautiful that he attained that status that he sought after, and now, in turn, he is able to provide his family with that glamour and security that his family couldn't provide. I guess so, yeah. Right? So Griffin mentioned that his father had a difficult relationship with his own father, who would call him a sissy and physically abuse him. He shared an anecdote about his grandfather beating his father with a belt while receiving a phone call from the hospital, temporarily interrupting the beating to offer medical advice. Griffin believed that this traumatic experience influenced his father's tendency to stand up against bullies and take on fights. When asked how his father felt about fame, when he himself became famous through his writing and interactions with celebrities, Griffin explained that his father was constantly amazed and thrilled by his own fame. He never grew accustomed to being recognized or acknowledged, finding it astonishing that even cab drivers knew who he was. Every day, Dominic Dunn expressed his disbelief at his own fame, and it remained a source of wonder for him. Griffin Dunn shared an anecdote about his father's genuine joy and enthusiasm for fame and celebrity encounters. He recounted a voicemail his father left him from the Chateau Marmont, excitedly telling him about riding an elevator with Bono and expressing his amazement that someone like Bono knew who he was. Griffin found his father's delight infectious and would listen to the voicemail with a smile, appreciating his father's unfiltered happiness. Growing up surrounded by fame and celebrity through his father's connections, Griffin was exposed to the world of celebrities. He mentioned that in the 1960s, his father was obsessed with gaining acceptance from celebrities and would host frequent dinner parties to impress them. Griffin still finds it confounding that his father, who worked as a television executive, would entertain renowned filmmakers, producers, and actors from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He recalled being a child, bundled up in a bathrobe and pajamas, sometimes even checking into a hotel if the party was expected to be particularly wild. <laughs> Griffin describes these parties as raucous affairs with drinking, dancing, and revelry that lasted until dawn, with guests often showing up to work the next day with hangovers. His father would document the parties through photographs, capturing moments of fights, tears, and uproarious laughter. Despite the seemingly glamorous and fun atmosphere, Griffin noted that his father's social standing was tied to the appearance and attendance of these celebrities. When his father faced financial difficulties in a crumbling marriage, he discovered that many of the people he entertained were not true friends, but merely enjoyed the parties and the venue he provided. The relationships turned out to be shallow, and he was left with little support when he was broke. Regarding his father's early career, Griffin mentioned that Dominic Dunn worked as a stage manager for the Howdy Doody show, although it was before Griffin's time. He recalled his father telling entertaining stories about the crew's mischievous and often risque antics behind the scenes of the show. Griffin Dunn explained that his father, Dominic, had initially led a superficial life prioritizing acceptance and validation from the celebrity circle he associated with. He would iron invitations he received from others into a scrapbook and sought validation from the renowned figures like Selznick. However, his mother, Lenny, craved more substance in their lives and grew tired of the constant socializing and parties. Dominic's drive for acceptance took precedence over family, which inevitably led to the breakdown of their marriage. That reminds me of, do you ever see The Greatest Showman? It's kind of based on the life of P.T. Barnum. Uh, I really want to. Hugh Jackman, mm -hmm. right? Plays, plays Zach Efron. P.T. Barnum, yeah. Um, but it's kind of like the same deal. Like he's wow. so enveloped and like he's chasing this dream and like he finally attains this dream of like status and celebrity, but ultimately it leads to the demise of the marriage because, yeah. well, you got to watch the whole thing. I don't want to spoil anything. Don't spoil but, it. I do want to watch it. But it's kind of like the same deal. And also it kind of, it kind of seems like he's got like a Gatsby complex a little bit. Mm. Like he's mm. always, he's after the glitz and the glamour, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Dominic Dunn party, not the substance. So... <laughs> 
Yeah. Anyway, go on. So when the separation occurred, Griffin and his siblings stayed with their mother. He recounted the moment when his parents informed them about the divorce, revealing that his father deviated from the initial plan and became emotional. While Dominic deeply loved Lenny, their marriage couldn't withstand the lack of substance and the superficiality of his priorities at the same time. Griffin shared that after the divorce, his father went through a difficult period characterized by downward spiraling drinking problems and financial struggles. Dominic had to sell off his possessions, including his dog, Aww. in order to survive. Eventually, he moved to New York and coincidentally ended up living around the corner from Griffin. In his eulogy for his father, Griffin touched upon the period and the ways in which their relationship evolved during that time. During the interview, Griffin discussed how his father, Dominic, experienced a significant turning point in his life after the tragic murder of Griffin's sister, Dominique. The trial and its outcome deeply affected Dominic. The killer was convicted of manslaughter and received a sentence of only two and a half years. Well, he received six, but he only served out Three. less than that, right? right? Which Dominic considered a grave injustice. The judge presiding over the case made the statement that angered Dominic particularly when he thanked the jury on behalf of the court, the defense, and the Dunn family. In response, Dominic stood up and declared that they did not thank the jury and accused them of making a grave mistake. He was then forcibly removed from the courtroom. Dominic's outburst and his subsequent writing about the trial became a defining moment for him, giving him a powerful voice to convey the outrage and injustice he witnessed. Griffin highlighted that the trial exposed the prevailing attitudes of the time where victims of violence were often blamed and they st still they are. They still are. Yeah. And their character was unjustly attacked. Dominic's article about the trial, which he wrote for Vanity Fair, became one of the most impactful and significant works as he passionately captured the injustice and tragedy of his daughter's death. It's evident from the conversation that Griffin Dunn attended the courtroom proceedings throughout the trial. He mentioned that his mother, who was in a wheelchair, faced attempts by the defense to have her removed from the courtroom based on the concern that her presence might prejudice the jury. Because she was in a goddamn wheelchair? What the fuck? The defense even oh. sought to have Dunn's brother, Alex, ejected from the courtroom when they noticed he was crying during the cross-examination. What the hell? Griffin Dunn also discussed at his father's funeral and the experience of giving the eulogy. He mentioned that his father had been discussing his funeral plans for many years, providing revisions and instructions about who should speak, service pallbearers, and more. Despite the grief he was experiencing, Dunn rose to the occasion and delivered a well-written eulogy in front of a large gathering, including many famous individuals. He also shared a proud moment as a father when his daughter, Hannah, sang a song called My Funny Valentine during the Aww. funeral. Even though the church initially objected to the secular song, Hannah's performance was powerful and deeply moving, and Dunn believed his father would have been able to hear it from where he was. Mm. Overall, Dunn's reaction to the emotional and challenging experiences he and his family went through during the trial and the funeral, highlighting moments of resilience and strength amid grief. And you can find the link... We're going to link it to Griffin Dunn's eulogy for his father at this freshair.npr.org, and it will be in our show notes. And I guess in honor of him and his daughter, Dominique, we should add my funny Valentine to our MSR yeah. playlist. Let's do that. All right. So we're, we're nearing the end here. I think we wanted to end Griffin's episode on a more current note. What is he up to now? He's still influencing a lot of other actors that are in our in our bubble today. Yeah. Is this the most recent article you could find about him? Yeah. That wasn't talking about the This Is Us, I think. All right. So this is from IndieWire. And this was actually published February 4th this past year, 2023. Paul Rudd says he decided to study acting after watching Scorsese's After Hours. The Ant-Man star decides to take his craft seriously after watching Griffin Dunn's sublime performance on the film. In this new interview with uh, Men's Health, Paul Rudd revealed that Scorsese's 1985 dark comedy After Hours has been one of the biggest influences on his acting career, both in and outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is a quote from Paul Rudd. He says, Griffin Dunn has been through so much, which we just read about we, we just told you guys all about all of his life like he's had a hectic life and a great career so rudd said when asked about his first impressions of the film and he finally finds a safe harbor in some guy's loft because there's a mob out in the streets looking for him and he calls the cops and they say go get some sleep and they hang up on him but he doesn't get mad he's just stupefied and he says oh wow oh wow <laughs> 
The only emotion is surprise. It's beyond frustration and it is sublime. <laughs> it reminds me of that scene you and I were talking about in the money pit where the tub falls through and like <laughs> Tom Hanks just l- loses it. Uh-huh. Oh my goodness. It can't, um, it can't get any worse. Like it's now like comic, like universal comic. It's like, you know, when you're driving to work and you get a flat tire and then you finally get back on the road and then you get pulled over and then, and then it starts uh, raining and then it starts raining and then like it's one thing after another. And at that point, it can you can only laugh about it, right? You can only get yep. mad up to a certain point and then it just becomes laughable. Like, you're like of course. Like somebody has had to have written a movie about this at some point because it's just God. nobody would believe the story if you told them. Right. right. So Rudd says he walked away from that film with a newfound commitment to studying the craft of acting. That led him to turning down bigger film offers to spend a year working in theater immediately after the success of Clueless. So while his representatives were not thrilled with his decision, Rudd says it was an essential step in his artistic development. My agent said, what are you doing? My career was just starting, he said. But I had a real clear vision then of what I wanted and how I wanted to do it. I didn't want to be considered a joke among actors who I really admire. I really wanted to learn how to do this right. I had a real focus. After cutting his teeth on the stage, Paul Rudd returned to film work with a newfound confidence in his abilities. Certainly some of the movies were not as good as I had imagined, but they were beneficial each in their own way, he said before citing Wet Hot American Summer as an early project that changed the trajectory of his career. Without that, I don't know if I would get to do Anchorman, which was seminal. And I've gotten to work with Judd Apatow for years now. Did you ever see Wet Hot American Summer? Uh, like the, isn't it like a miniseries, like a TV show? I think I saw like t- two episodes. It was a movie before they made it into the series. Okay. But you got to watch the movie first because okay. the, the show, I'm pretty sure it's like a continuation of the movie. Okay. But hilarious. Hysterical. <laughs> Uh, Jeanine Garofalo is in it. There's some I other like her. famous people in it, but it is the goofiest movie. Oh, and uh, Amy Poehler. Um, mm-hmm. So funny. So funny. Gotta watch it. I wanted to search real quick for some more quotes because I he has been in so much stuff. He's been in so many interviews. So I'm just, I'm on brainyquote.com and like, I'm just going to pull out a couple of these. And if you see ones that, that stick out to you, go for it. But um, he has a quote on here saying, but I remember feeling as a producer, I felt like the guy who called the caterer and got the band. I had to work the party while everyone else was having a good time. And he also says, quote, as a director, I've been able to combine what I've learned as an actor and as a producer. It melds quite nicely into what I feel like I should have been doing all along. Every movie is wildly different so many of the problems are the same but they take on different guises he says i like being able to go back and forth and i don't really care if it's a small budget or a big budget or a studio or independent as long as it's got a story that's compelling and there's enough money to make the picture <laughs> he, he has a quote about new york he says new york means so much to people if you're inclined to leave the nest new york is where most people think they have to go and it's been that way since the first skyscraper Mm. It's so true. Like whenever you see like movies about like a young actress that wants to make it, they either go to Hollywood or they go to New York. Right. Right. This Uh. one's interesting. I met Steve McQueen once. Well, met really isn't the right word. I wonder what the story is there. I wonder what that means. What is that? This is through AZ quotes and he says, every time I act in something, I learn something about what the actor is doing. One feeds the other. I love working with actors. I love to see what they're going to do. There's just something very thrilling and satisfying with being involved with something all the way through the process, the movie making process. When you're directing, I feel like I'm playing all the parts without the makeup. And I get really into the heads of these characters, which is what Nicole Kidman and Goran were saying that he just like embodied behind the camera. He is acting this out along with them. Yeah. He's very animated. He's got a very animated personality. I was looking for more on the Steve McQueen thing. Like, I don't know what interview that came from. I wanted to see his elaboration on that story. Right. That quote, it just piqued my interest. Like, what does that mean? You don't, you didn't actually meet him. I don't know what that means. I can't find any um, elaboration on it, though. I love this. This resonates because like one of my favorite quotes is happiness is only real when shared because you could be the happiest in the world. But like, wouldn't it be better if like you're sitting alone? Like sometimes I'll sit alone out out in the yard and I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful evening. I'm having a nice cup of whatever. And I'm like, this would be better if like a friend was here. You know, right. it's it just yeah. better. But right. the quote he says is to see a comedy in an environment where you're surrounded by other people that are laughing is great. 
probably more satisfying than just watching it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I like, you ever watch a movie that you've seen before, but the other person hasn't, and you're just waiting for them to react or laugh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like experiencing that film or that experience for the first time all over again, because you're now seeing it from the eyes of somebody who is experiencing for the first time. I took Avi to, uh, well, I didn't take him to Disney World. We went to Disney World together, but I had been there, you know, this goes poison. I had been there before, but like now um, with somebody who has never been there uh -huh. and we went, I think for his 30th birthday. And then we went back again for my brother's 30th who had never been there. So it's fun just like being able to go back to the same places with somebody fresh who's never experienced before and experience I agree. Yeah. for the first time all over again through well, their just the same thing that we're going to do in Salem. Yeah. You're going to be like, oh my God, uh -huh. you know, watching me absorb yeah. everything. Right. And it's just exciting. It's more exciting to just experience that with, with somebody new, you know? I agree. So I completely get that sentiment. Um, did you did, want to add anything else? The only thing we didn't dive too much further down the rabbit hole is the whole This Is Us thing. Because I know that that show was a hot commodity for a while. And I, I don't know much about it because I'd never watched it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if his role was a big one. I know he was Uncle Nicky, but like, I don't know if that was like a big role or a small role. Right. I think it was reoccurring. For sure. I'm just reading real quick. Okay, so there's an article on today.com. This article is titled, The This Is Us star Griffin Dunn on balancing the tragic and comic in Uncle Nicky. So he reflects on his, on the evolution of Nicky Pearson, his character from This Is Us, in this interview. And this was posted on May 12th, 2022, and this was written by Aaron Clements. So when Griffin Dunn was cast as Nikki Pearson on This Is Us, he recalls thinking the family's estranged uncle sounded like a great, complicated, tragic character who would probably transform into something else over the course of the show. Dunn began playing Nikki, a Vietnam veteran struggling with PTSD and alcoholism in the series' third season. Pearson, patriarch Jack, as we know him, Milo Ventimiglia, mm -hmm. had told his wife and kids that Nikki died after the brothers had a falling out during the war. But Kevin Pearson, played by Justin Hartley, later discovered that Nikki was alive and he and siblings Kate, played by Chrissy Metz, and Randall, played by Sterling K. Brown, tracked down Nikki at his trailer in Bradford, Pennsylvania. Since then, he's become a beloved, if sometimes grumpy, member of the Pearson clan, even inspiring Kevin to name one of his twins after him. I think the most challenging part of playing Uncle Nicky has to be the walk the line between an unsentimental person and a certain kind of inner bitterness he fights within himself, and also to be funny, Dunn told today. You know, it's always been a balance of tragic and then comic and tragic and comic, which is a lot like his own personal life, right? Like yeah, balancing the fine line between the tragedy and the comedy. Mm -hmm. Dunn said his favorite scene was the poignant monologue Nikki delivers to Kevin's twins when Nikki unexpectedly travels to California to meet his great nephew and great niece in the season five episode, One Small Step. That just hit me very personally about him speaking to those sleeping infants, he said, and it was so beautifully written, and it meant a great deal to me personally. It just hit home. He also enjoyed all the screen time his character had shared with the Hartleys. I'd say that the funniest times I've had on set, both on camera and in between takes, has to be with Justin. We just have a really great rapport and make each other laugh, and we don't fall into, you know, a typical sentimentality. You know, our sort of edge toward each other plays against that, so it's all been really rewarding to have so many scenes with Justin. Dunn said it's been particularly satisfying to hear from viewers that Nikki's story has resonated with their own families. I've heard from Vietnam vets, he said, and I've heard from soldiers and their families who have fought in our more recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that they are, you know, thankful to see their post-war trauma portrayed. You know, it's very meaningful to me, and I feel very proud of that. Earlier in the show's sixth and final season, Nikki went on a road trip to find his first love, Sally, introduced Aww. in season five flashbacks to his younger years. But at the end of the episode, we learn that Nikki's future wife is actually Edie, played by Vanessa Bell Calloway, a flight attendant he meets on his return home to the East Coast. When I found out Edie was Nikki's love interest, well, I was completely surprised. I, probably like the audience, thought it would be the woman I've been pining for for the past 47 years and just assumed. I underestimated the writers again, just thinking predictably. So when I got to the scene of him giving sass to Edie in the airplane, I just smiled. Right after the episode, people will come up to me and go, I'm so happy for you, Uncle Nicky. I'm so glad you finally found love. Like mm -hmm. I was actually Uncle Nicky, Dunn added. Aww. It just shows how satisfying I think that was for both, Nicky and the audience, that the surprise in his life had happened. Dunn said he was happy with how Nicky's story wraps up because his part was sort of put to rest and we knew he'd be okay. 
And from then on, Nikki and Edie were suddenly a team and were just like kind of a fun loving smart ass couple, you know, involved in all the family proceedings that would be coming ahead. Filming the final episode of This Is Us, which comes to an end on May 24th, was very emotional, the actor said. At the wrap, all the principals gave a very moving speech of thanks and everybody was very moved, he said. A lot of tears were going around. In between filming all the tear jerking scenes, This Is Us is known for recent storylines that have involved Rebecca's experience with Alzheimer's disease and the death of her husband Miguel, played by John Huertas, the This Is Us cast also appeared to be having some fun on set. Last month, Dunn and his co-star shared a video of the Pearsons performing the wobble while dressed for Kate's wedding to Philip. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people thought it was like a dance sequence at the wedding, he said, but it was just all of us, you know, doing the wobble during our lunch break. <laughs> Dunn, also a director and producer, is known for other unforgettable roles from Paul Hackett in Martin Scorsese's 1985 dark comedy After Hours to Veda, yeah, here it is, to Veda's teacher and crush, Mr. Bixler, in the 1991 coming-of-age film My Girl. There we go. Here we go. But he says these days he gets recognized for This Is Us the most. My background as an actor has been mostly in independent films that are seen by a certain kind of more art house sort of audience. And the other films that I've done, I've been behind the camera as a director, he said. So I get recognized most more than any other time in my career as Uncle Nicky because it's a network show with a bigger audience than I have ever been involved with before. So it's definitely Uncle Nicky. So that's just a little bit about Uncle Nicky if you're not too familiar with This Is Us. I was never interested in watching This Is Us before because I've heard it's just such heavy emotional material. But knowing that Griffin Dunn is involved and adding that little bit of comedic, I guess, relief, it might it could be, be anybody else though, but the fact that it's Griffin, like right. you, you want to watch it for him. It seems refreshing, right? Uh huh. He's just adorable. It does seem heavy. I I wanted to watch it because I love Milo, but like, yeah, I heard, it just was like. And then the whole what was it? Not, not a pressure cooker. Uh, yeah, or like a, a slow cooker or something. Cooker. I was like, I'm not watching this shit. Yeah, yeah. I feel like a lot has been spoiled up mm -hmm. to this point for me. Like I've just been hearing about it more than you know. I've never watched it, so I I don't know anything about it other than what I've heard from it. And yeah, that was one of the main stories, the pressure cooker. So all right, this last thing I just wanted to comment on because I was just looking at pictures. Like I was like Griffin Dunn. Let's see, let's see where you've been mm -hmm. scrolling, 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 and I see a picture of him, and underneath it says obsessed with Griffin Dunn's talking penis. So of what? course I had to click on it. All right. <laughs> what? So this is from permanentplastichelmet.com and it's run by someone named Ashley Clark. Um, but they, they're they saying that they've been a big fan of Griffin Dunn's acting from American Werewolf in London to After Hours. And they say, so you can imagine how my curiosity was piqued when I discovered the existence of a film starring Dunn named Me and Him. 1988, directed by Doris Dory, which promised to capture the white collar sexual and an <laughs> A-N-O- M-I-E. Anomaly. Anomaly? Okay. Anomaly? Sexual anomaly at the end of the 1980s. Less distinguishing as American Psycho, but perhaps a sharper vampire's kiss, which I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Have you seen American Psycho? Is that the one with Christian Bale? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A pithy IMDb summary on me and him runs as thus, quote, a man's enthusiastic penis starts talking to him, getting him into awkward situations and convincing everyone he tells that he's completely insane. So he's trying to like explain, no, my penis is talking to me. <laughs> and they're like, you're fucking insane. What the hell? Says, Sounds good. And then good is crushed out. Great, right? Right? The problem, no one's ever heard of it and no one has seen it. In terms of critical response, there's nothing out there, say from an average rating of 4.1 from IMDb users. There's not a single critic's review on the usually overflowing Rotten Tomatoes. So this person says, I've got my hopes up when I saw 21 related news items on the IMDb homepage in regard to this. Carrying the headline, King of Leon, to guess on Iron Chef. It seems like they hit a dead end. Wait, so does this exist on a streaming platform somewhere? Can we watch this? I don't know. What is the name of the movie? Me and Him, 1988. It says, it doesn't seem to be available anywhere, not even a knackered VHS copy. It has been so deeply ghettoized that even the utterly bizarre trailer, which intercut scenes from the film with faux, at least I think they're faux, box props of women praising the film's insight into masculinity. It shows how men can be really sensitive. I had to dig it up from an obscure site called Video Detective. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's on Tubi for free. Oh I just pulled it God. up. 
So this, when did I say this was written? They did include an update. It says my normally um, my normal attention to detail failed and it kicked in on this occasion. I forgot to check Amazon.com, which is slightly more fruitful on a me and him tip that Amazon.co.uk. My key question remains. Is it on there? On where? Is it on Amazon? I don't know, but it's on Tubi. <laughs> I just found it. It's an hour and 33 minutes. Fucking weird. Yeah. I don't know if I want to see Griffin like this. Come on. It's not tempting to want to watch this. This sounds insane. Put it in the link. Put it in our notes. All right. I'm going to put it in the show notes. If you guys want to watch this. It's an hour and a half? Yeah. It's a movie. It's a feature f- feature film. Wow. Um, I don't know. Maybe if you guys, you know what we should do? We should start like putting polls up for the movie nights. Like, what do you guys want to watch at the next movie night? You know, mm-hmm. let us know. Mm -hmm. so yeah we just had our first movie night the stevie nicks uh watch party also we should probably do a poll on like what are the best times that you guys want to do these movie nights or movie watch parties yeah you guys pick since we're not doing our book club anymore right we'll throw out some movies and watch times and we'll we'll coordinate because we want everybody to be able to come right yeah all right (laughs) i want to watch this now this is oh god this is this has, has piqued my interest if Joe's apartment wasn't enough to pique your interest, <laughs> this was definitely enough to pique mine. Then in such an array. Yeah. A film. Right, right. So wait, is this a, did it say dark comedy? Is this a dark comedy? Comedy fantasy, it says. Interesting. All right. All right. Speaking of penis movies. <laughs> <laughs> what? Going back to Ron Jeremy, he was in a movie called One-Eyed Monster, and yeah. it's a, it's a B horror movie. I think it's about this this penis that goes on a killing rampage. Oh my god. And whenever the penis kills somebody, you see it from the penis's perspective. It's hysterical. Oh my god. But yeah, I just wanted to just wanted to is it, so it's because he was also in Boondock Saints, but it's like it's not an X rated thing, is it? No, it's a co- well, there is nudity and I think some sexual material in it, but it's not a it's not a Okay. Porn. Okay. It's a B it's a B it's a stupid ass B horror comedy yeah it's horrible oh, in the right best here. way in the best on that note guys thanks for hanging out with us on magnolia street come yeah. check us out on instagram at magnolia street podcast you can email us magnolia street podcast at gmail.com please come over to our patreon uh if you feel so inclined to support us there's no pressure to do so but we have tons of tears um i say tons we have quite a few tiers for your budget mm-hmm. ranging from one dollar to fifteen dollars you can get out on the polls that help us pick out the shows. You can help us with the watch parties. Um, and we like putting it in your hands so you feel like you're a part of the creative process, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's all That's all we have. Leave us a review. You can leave us a star rating on Spotify or if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, which I just checked our analytics and we are ahead with Apple Podcast listeners by like maybe 5%. Wow. Or something like that. So Apple podcasters are beating out the Spotify. Leave us a review. Even if, if it's just like, hi, give yeah. us the stars and just hi. So we know you're there and then we can share your hello with everyone. Yeah. So we know, we, we know you're there, Apple podcast listeners. We know you're there. So don't be shy. We want to know your thoughts. Please, 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 please leave us a written review. We want to say hi to you. I think this comes out right after the summer solstice. So we hope everybody had a great summer solstice and you embraced those sky clad vibes and mm-hmm. you showed the sun your taint. taint. <laughs> <laughs> and remember the nudity is entirely optional. Perfect. As you will remember. I'm Justina. I'm Christina. We'll, we'll see you next, next time. time. Yes. At that house down the street. On Magnolia Street